Good, good morning. It appears that Councillor Stroud is a few minutes late, so we'll start the meeting uh, this way. Um, I call the meeting to order, and the next item is the approval of the agenda. Uh, are there any, well, can we have a motion to approve the agenda? Okay. Um, um, I notice you've been, there's a, an addendum um, that should be included in the, in the uh, agenda relating to uh, the City Hall. So, um, if there is any, uh, is there any discussion about the agenda? Then can I ask for uh, a vote to approve the agenda, including the addendum? All those in favor? That's carried, thank you. Um, Confirmate. Oh, I think um, Councillor Strout has arrived. We need a mover and seconder for the minutes from last meeting. Moved by Councillor Shell, seconded by Don. Any errors or omissions to these minutes? Okay, we'll vote on the minutes from August 15th. All those in favor? Opposed, and that carries. Disclosure of pecuniary interest? Yes, Mac. I don't have, I don't have, but just, uh, I've got to leave here about uh, 20 after 12, just for information. Yes, so just, uh, yeah, before, okay, so before we do disclosure of pecuniary interest, there's seven members in the committee now, with their recent resignations, so we need four for quorum, and there's six of us here. Catherine, you are leaving early, I think it? 12. And Max leaving at 12.20. But if everybody else is still here at that point, we'll have quorum. If not, we will lose quorum. If anyone else leaves before Mac, we lose quorum when Mac leaves. Okay, so let's try to finish the agenda before then. Disclosure of pecuniary interest. Yes, Catherine. Is that 81 King Street? Yeah. 81 King Street. Sorry, uh, when you disclose, you have to say why, uh, and you have to turn on your mic, and have to say why it is a pecuniary interest. Uh, because I'm involved in exterior colors. Anyone else? Seeing none. We now have presentations. Are there any? Delegations? Did we receive? No? Briefings, um, no briefings. We do have uh, cultural heritage business under 8A, so that comes next. There's the civic collection acquisitions. You'll see the first report in your package was on this topic. And there's a recommendation. So uh, probably someone from cultural staff will introduce this item. The um, first five pages of the package are de devoted to this item. Go ahead. Thank you, and through you. Um, this is uh, a pretty standard representation, as we've seen in the past, of how we bring items forward for consideration. There are um, a series of items related to the centennial program of the city of Kingston, the tercentennial celebrations of Kingston, um, as well as, I think quite interestingly, some steam gauges from the Pump House Museum, which are being on offer by former employees of that site prior to it becoming a city asset. We also have a coin holder um, from Kingston Transit. And then we're also recommending um, a hockey sweater be adopted as a non-collection display asset. And just as a reminder to the committee, those are assets that we don't hold in the same way as we do proper civic collection objects. So civic collection objects that are wholly admitted into the collection are cared for and conserved to museum quality and standards. 
Um, objects like the one of this hockey sweater we're recommending would remain as display objects and pieces. That doesn't mean in the future we couldn't consider them to be sort of moved yeah. in as full objects in the civic collection, but that's the intent. So uh, committee members have the opportunity now to ask questions about this report. Seeing none, there is a recommendation, we'll need a mover and a seconder, that Heritage Kingston recommend to council to accept the four acquisitions and that the acquisition, uh, the hockey sweater, be, uh, be accepted as a non-collection display object. So, do we have to do two votes or one? So that we're going to vote, we need a mover and seconder for both recommendations. We're going to vote once for both recommendations, moved by Councillor Shell, seconded by Mac. Any discussion? Seeing none, I'll call the, the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? And that carries. Thank you. And thank you to staff. So the second item of cultural heritage business is your stories, our history's public engagement process, pro, sorry, project, 2018-2019. Um, yes, so this is important work, and I believe there's a short presentation on the subject. Thank you. Um, so thank you for letting me, letting me uh, introduce this report. Um, today we're talking about the Your Stories, Our Histories um, engagement project, and I do have cards available. I don't know if I can pass those out to members of the committee or members of the public. Um, this project is really an opportunity for the community to get involved in a conversation about what stories we tell about the city of Kingston. That can include stories we've told in the past, stories that need to be revisited, re-emphasized, and stories we've missed. Um, and this really is drawn on work that the Cultural Services Department in particular has been working on over the course of the last almost 10 years, starting with the Kingston Culture Plan in 2010. And in the Culture Plan, it was identified that Kingston's most compelling cultural asset is its powerful historical narrative. And it directed that it was one of the, the requirements of the city is to consider how it tells an inclusive and complex history about our city. Following the Culture Plan, um, we also see uh, coming out of the initiatives and the calls of action in that report, um, a series of new reports and policy adoptions that sort of start to speak to what it is to tell a compelling and robust story for the city. So we have the Integrated Cultural Heritage and Tourism Strategy in 2014, the Commemoration Strategy 2015, and as this committee has seen more recently and, and in the past, we've had museum reports that speak to what we're doing within our exhibitions, what we're planning for the next seasons, and how this committee and committees before it have helped to inform the kinds of histories that we're able to represent adoptions to the civic collection, for an example, as a mechanism of ensuring we're able to tell stories by the preservation of related objects. Um, coming out of these documents, I think most important to the, the item on the table today is the direction that there are histories that perhaps are less well known, less well told, um, or those that perhaps require maybe a deeper dive to get their, their whole story on the table before us. And as a result of those sort of conversations and those moments, there were a number of kind of thematic areas that had been identified through these processes. And this project that we're, we've begun is really an opportunity to consider more, to explore those thematic processes more deeply perhaps, and to really contribute to the development of a cultural heritage strategy for how we tell those compelling narratives of the city of Kingston through all of the city's assets, the cultural assets, our events, our programming, our community, education initiatives, et cetera. So that leads us to the Your Stories, Our Histories, this community conversation to build the inclusive history of Kingston. And as you are familiar with, the, the city in 2017 adopted and has been working with an engagement process, and that has used an online platform called Get Involved Kingston as one of the mechanisms we have in our, in our toolkit, so to speak, to get ideas out to the public and to invite them into more direct engagement exercises. So on September 6th, you may have noted the launch of this project on the Get Involved platform, as well as with um, an update to an installation here at City Hall that I'm just going to briefly highlight in a moment. 
This came out of those initial works of the city of Kingston through the Cultural Services Department, but it also was coming out of the work that you have seen in the notes of the Cultural Heritage Working Group often contexted in the conversation of the market wing development, conversations about the interpretation of objects and, and stories here at City Hall. And we knew through that working group that we were going to be going into an engagement exercise that the working group would help to support that was called for in all of those, those earlier studies and strategy documents. And so we see coming out of the summer of 2018, we had pre-engagement planning with the Cultural Heritage Working Group, again, tracked through the notes that come through this committee. And then into the fall and winter, we begin our community input and story gathering to lead us to a more direct engagement series of exercises in spring winter 2019. So the engagement process is intended to identify a list of themes, issues, topics that could be used to develop future programming, exhibits, events, educational offerings at Kingston City Hall or across other city assets and sites. And I'm going very quickly, <laughs> cognizant of time, but I also have to, in the report, there is reference given to the fact that there is also a very you know, direct engagement with the concept or the stories and the histories related to Sir John A. MacDonald. And we knew in cultural services that this was a, a, an important moment in the history of the nation, and often we were seeing that people were looking to Kingston to start to have this conversation. And so through this engagement exercise where we're trying to think about how we tell Kingston stories, it would obviously seem the natural place to put and have and host and, and, and foster a conversation about how we tell the inclusive story of Sir John A. MacDonald. And I think it's really important here to point out, um, as is pointed out in the information report, that there is no direct outcome identified through this process in that this is really about gathering. It's about taking the ideas from the community and then using them as guiding principles on the move forward to tell more inclusive histories. So there is no sort of objective, if you will, through this process. I did want to quickly highlight some of the things that have happened at City Hall as a National Historic Site relevant for this committee um, that speaks to the museum's side of your portfolio. Um, downstairs in the Sir John A. MacDonald room, we began an installation um, that had already begun to problematize Sir John A., at least thinking through post-2015 how the city has been um, aware of the unfolding national and local dialogue around Sir John A. MacDonald and his history, um, and also considering you know, his relationship to the founding of this country and the nation building that comes out of this. So currently, if you go downstairs in that room, you see the, the pre-existing installation, but you also now see that there is an added um, component that offers people an opportunity as, as it's sort of divided in the space. It says to read, share, and participate. And I would encourage everyone to you know, visit the space if you can. It's an opportunity to learn more about what the city has and its sort of assets related to Sir John A. It's also an opportunity to read some of the current news media um, from across the sort of landscape of dialogue about Sir John A. MacDonald locally and nationally. And it's also an opportunity to participate by completing a comment card and leaving your input and, and ideas and thoughts about Sir John A. MacDonald in particular. This then does also invite you to participate in the broader engagement exercise. And I just wanted to capture here, um, we don't often see what's happening on the Get Involved site, um, but this is uh, the, the first sort of uptick here is the start date of this engagement activity and exercise. And you see that on that first day, we had almost 1,000 people visiting the site in traffic. And every day since, you know, we receive stories, input, feedback, but we're also getting site visitation. And so this is a prelude, we hope, to the directed engagement that's going to happen in January. So as I said, you know, this is the beginning of a conversation. Right now you can leave your comments, your ideas, your thoughts, your stories online. You can go downstairs, leave a comment card in our Sir John A. MacDonald display. Um, and you can also follow the program as it's outlined on the website. So in winter, as I've said, the public engagement, we will have a facilitator who will come on board to help us to host community meetings, conversations, focus groups. You know, what that looks like is where we are right now in the planning stage. So the input received right now will help us to frame the conversations that will unfold in January and continue from there. So if you haven't already, um, I invite you to, to get on the Get Involved platform. It's not just this project, it's a lot of city projects and there's an opportunity there for you to participate in those projects or to follow them, which means you will get updates when those engagement exercises are actually on the calendar. Thank you very much. 
Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I guess questions from members of the committee are in order at this point. Councilor Schell. Uh, thank you for that. Um, and I'm going to try and get to that next meeting in October. Um, the market wing, is, is this all folded into it that all this is all also leading toward how we're going to use the market wing, how citizens, what they feel they need in terms of a, a spot to go for the history and, the, and this type of consultation? Like sort of a, is it that part of the idea, a major spot for learning? Thank you, and through you, Mr. Chair. Absolutely. Um, you know, the, the conversation, and that's why you saw it coming through the working group notes often prefaced in that market wing conversation, because we knew that if we start to interpret space in the market wing, we had an opportunity to do something we haven't had space, quite frankly, to do previously, which is to tell more stories about the city of Kingston that aren't specific to the pump house, that aren't specific to the McLaughlin, and haven't already been interpreted as part of City Hall as a, as a national historic site. So the ideas from this are, will be available to be applied in that development in the market wing, um, but also, as I said, across city facilities and sites. So if we get ideas for histories that we might be able to incorporate at the pump house for an exhibition season, then we'll certainly apply them where and, and as we can. Any other members of the committee? I, I have a qu question. I guess it's related to uh, next steps for us specifically here at the committee um, as this. Uh, so we, you, you just explained that the uh, public engagement piece started on September 6th and uh, presumably it will run for a length of time. Is that known at this point, how long we will be trying to engage the public on this? Uh, project? So the online facilitation, that online opportunity to submit stories will run for the duration of the project. It will help to, to frame what's going to begin in January, but it will continue past. In January, we're expecting to spend maybe as many as six months, maybe eight months, working on public engagement exercises face-to-face -face with the community. And the idea was that there would be a working report essentially put forward um, in the end of 2019, beginning of 2020. So just over a year from now, this will return to us here we'll, with a lot more flesh on the bones, I guess, and, uh, and for an opportunity for uh, the committee input, I guess, at that point. Is that correct? Sorry, I didn't catch the last part. And, and, and will there be an opportunity for committee input uh, at, the po at the point where that report arrives uh, at the end of next year? Certainly, I, I think this will come up to the committee through working group notes, but also likely through information reports or depending on what the output is. The cultural heritage strategy document that will be developed would also be shared through this committee and an opportunity like with other strategy documents, illumination policy, et cetera, um, an opportunity to give feedback and input, certainly. And is there anything else uh, that would be required from committee members as this project unfolds, other than participating as, as citizens, as anyone can participate? There has been conversation at the working group about the role of Heritage Kingston, perhaps as a quote-unquote stakeholder, as defined in IAP2 terminology, which is really a, a vested group within the community that has specific expertise or interest into a certain subject. Um, and so there may be, depending on how the facilitation starts to come together, an invitation to the committee to participate in some of those engagement exercises in a more directed way. So invited as representative members from this committee to attend one of those community event engagements. Okay, I will now invite members of the public to comment or ask questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Frank Dixon, resident of Kingston. Um, I'm giving staff and council an A-plus on the idea that you're taking this on. Um, from a professional historian standpoint, guiding the project, outstanding um, concept that you're, you're uh, going to attempt on this. Um, not going to say too much in detail right now. I do want to make sure that we get all or as much as we can of the McDonald Bicentennial uh, work that was done. 
I had the chance to take part in a lot of the public events on that, and it's really a fantastic uh, year that we um, basically carried it out. We were the leaders in Canada on that. Um, original drama was produced, uh, original music, um, a lot of symposium discussion, um, new biographies were done, all this fantastic stuff. So, and it's unearthed um, new aspects people didn't know about, and then that's led to protest, and that's all the Canadian way, right? So, um, just in terms of maybe accessing the the uh, McDonald Bicentennial material, like trying to get that as accessible as possible, if it's online or there are um, podcasts or um, CDs of performances and that kind of thing. I think that's a really extraordinarily valuable resource. It really had top class people involved with that and a lot of funding and just very inclusive, I thought. Obviously we didn't get it all, right? So, um, do you want to talk a little bit about one thing also that's coming up, I've talked about it in here before, is when McDonald was here in Kingston as a lawyer, he had as his partner, Oliver Mowat, who became the Premier of Ontario for, I think it was 24 years. And Mowat's bicentennial is 2020, on the year he was born. So some of this work may lead into some of the work that's hopefully being done on Mowat. It doesn't have quite the high profile because he moved away from Kingston and then was elected as MPP and then later Premier in Western Ontario. So, um, and then just with the media coverage from Victoria, McDonald was actually MP for Victoria. At, one at that time, you could run for MPs for, as an MP in two different, two different districts. He actually lost in Kingston and then ran in Victoria and won. And it's the terminus of the railway, of course, right? So um, he has a connection there. And then the connection was, well, there's a lot of complaints about what he did, residential schools, sure. But then they were to take down the statue, right? So. Um, something that many people don't understand is that he did have a major connection to Victoria. So, I think that's all I'm going to say. Um, but, you know, just uh, very high praise on everything that you're doing and uh, all the best. Thank you, Mr. Dixon. Is there anyone else from the public that wishes to speak? Okay, well, I guess that's it for this piece right now. Thank you and good luck with this important work. Thanks. Don't. Don't forget to grab a, um, one of these cards if you like before you leave. Just before we go to the next item, I just wanted to um, I just noticed when I glanced through the at the end of the package the cultural heritage group notes. I just want to point something out. So you'll remember Paul Carl, longtime member of this committee uh, of Aboriginal heritage. I believe it's Algonquin and uh, Iroquois heritage, and he's a he's a he calls himself a traditional man and he has a lot of knowledge uh, of the Aboriginal histories of this area. He's been a member of this committee for years, uh, since before I was actually a member. And he, he, his, his resignation from the committee was accepted by council last night. However, he is still a member of the Cultural Heritage Working Group. So he's still participating and he'll be working on this project as a member of the Cultural Heritage Working Group. Just wanted to point that out. So uh, we'll miss Paul around this horseshoe, but uh, He's, he remains committed to helping us, and that's a, he's a great uh, source of knowledge for us. I'd like to just point that out. Okay, so. Go back into, yeah. Okay, so there's nothing in B or C business, and then the 8D statutory business for the heritage permits. As usual, there are multiple items. The first one, is an application for a heritage permit at 4314 Highway 2. This would be a part four designation and looks like Ryan's going to introduce it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Indeed, it is a, a part four designation and it's an application for alteration. The property is located almost at the far eastern extent of, uh, of our jurisdiction. It's on the north side of Highway 2, uh, just east of Deer Ridge Drive and just uh, west of the border of, uh, of Leeds and Grenville. The property is known as the Fairman House. It was built sometime in the mid to late uh, 19th century. It's a, a sand-colored limestone uh, dwelling in an L shape. 
The application before, and it's, sorry, the reason for designation, it was designated in 1982 uh, under Part 4 of the Heritage Act. Uh, it has an association with uh, Elizabeth Fairman, who was a local heroine in the uh, Patriots War. Uh, it is a two-story front gabled farmhouse with an L-shaped plan constructed of an interesting uh, sand colored, sandstone colored limestone, and it's uh, noted as the heritage attributes on this property. The application before us today has to do with uh, an existing garage on the property, which uh, you can see before you is located on sort of the southwest corner of the property. Uh, it is not noted as a heritage attribute in the designating bylaws. Uh, it is a, a simple one-story wood frame uh, garage with three bays. The end, there is a date stone uh, that was discovered in the building marking 1969, so that's anticipated to be roughly the date that it was constructed. The application before this committee is to remove this structure and to uh, replace it with a similar, similarly designed structure. Uh, it's proposed again in the salt box design uh, in the local vernacular. It's uh, the foundation is to be clad in, in sandstone to, to pay tribute to the house uh, adjacent. Uh, it is, a, as I said, a wood frame in a natural color with a, a, an a viral shake shingle roof. It is going to be slightly larger than the existing structure. The existing structure is around 800 square feet. This one will be around 1,400 square feet. Uh, the detailed plans and the proposal are included in your agenda package uh, as exhibits B and C uh, for your reference. In terms of our review, uh, the design of this, uh, of this structure is complementary uh, to the, and sympathetic to the heritage attributes of the property. Uh, its design is sufficiently distinct as to distinguish it as new construction uh, and to avoid confusion or distraction from the, uh, the main focal point of the property, which is the stone building, the stone house. Uh, it is the trees along the road are to be maintained, which will help screen the view of this building from the road. And the new building remains uh, subordinate to and complementary and compatible with the, the heritage character of that property in the area and staff have, have no concerns. Uh, in terms of our review, or sorry, in terms of circulation, uh, railing staff know, of course, that demo and building permits are required for this undertaking. Uh, the forestry team notes that uh, they strongly recommend uh, tree protection and fencing around some of the adjacent trees to avoid damage and compaction to, the, uh, to those trees and the root systems. Uh, this committee was circulated as well, and we uh, received a few comments. Uh, which are outlined in your agenda package. Uh, there were no uh, specific concerns expressed with the proposal, uh, and some of the questions that were, that were provided by the committee members were provided to the applicants uh, and, uh, and outlined in our, our analysis. Uh, so, Mr. Chair, the recommendation is on the screen before you with a number of conditions. Thank you, Ryan. Any questions from members of the committee to staff? Seeing none, any questions from members of the public or comments? Seeing none, we'll move right to the recommendation. So we'll see it in the package um, that it is recommended to council that alterations to the property at 4314 Highway 2 be approved in accordance with the details described in the application deemed complete on August 7th. Alterations to include, and then there's a list, basically demolition and construction of a new garage in the same location. Um, and then the uh, two conditions. I need a mover and a seconder. Move by Mac, seconded by Catherine. Any discussion? Yes, Don. Uh, Jane and I were able to visit the site and we are certainly very impressed with the, uh, uh, the, the whole building, with well, the whole property, the house and the, um, and the plans for the new garage are very detailed and carefully presented. Uh, uh, we really have no problem, but I, I, I was concerned about one aspect of the new garage. Um, well, it, it's, it's not uh, uh, of great importance, but um, uh, it seemed to me that the um, proposal to put a porch across the front of the garage you can see it on page 26 uh, in your agenda package. Or, uh, there, it's on the screen. No, go back, go back. There. Um, you can see the porch with uh, posts and roof 
across the front of the garage. And it seemed to me that uh, this is rather unusual on a garage. Uh, porches of that nature are meant to shelter uh, people from uh, the weather or um, uh, in, in some cases there are barns with that kind of overhang to protect animals from the weather. But in this case, I don't think it serves any uh, good function. So I'm going to uh, uh, make an amendment to uh, recommend a condition. Uh, the, the motion is would be condition three to add condition three. The applicant is encouraged to omit the porch across the front of the garage since it has little functional value and it increases the size and impact of the garage. James, I have it written down. So uh, there's an amendment proposed. We need a seconder for the amendment. Who would like to second the amendment? Uh, well, I will second the amendment to get it on the floor. Mm -hmm. So, uh, would you like to read it and type it out and read it out? Or put it up on the screen? Are you able to put it up on? The clerk is just typing out the amendment. Once, um, once he's done that, it's, we're now discussion is only on the amendment, not on the overall project. Well, anyways, is, it, is there a way to get it up on the screen? Okay, so the clerk's gonna read out the amendment. So the amendment would be for a new condition three, which is that the applicant is encouraged to omit the porch across the front of the garage since it has little functional value and it increases the size and impact of the garage. Okay, uh, do you have anything else to say, Don? Uh, I don't think so, except that this is simply a suggestion to the owners. They don't have to uh, 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 accept it, but uh, you know, I think it uh, uh, is appropriate. Well, I don't, sorry, I don't think the porch is an appropriate uh, addition to this building, and uh, uh, why, not, why not omit it? Okay, so if passed, this would not be a binding uh, aspect of the permit. It would be, as, as stated in the amendment, uh, consider omitting that feature, but it, it, it's the, up to the discretion of the owner, if, if passed, whether or not to follow the amendment's recommendation. So it's sort of a non-binding suggestion, is, is what it is. So any other comments? Yes, Catherine. I do think it has a function, and the function, these are doors that uh, go outward, and in the winter, when you are bringing cars out of the garage and the snow, um, then you're gonna have to dig out to actually get the doors open. And so I think to actually have that amount of coverage in front of those doors um, is in fact um, a reasonable, um, requirement. Um, if the garage doors had been garage doors that go up as opposed to out, um, then I tend to agree. But um, given that that isn't the case, I think that um, that in the winter time it would be very helpful to have that roof over the garage doors. Uh, Councillor Shell, will you take the chair? I want to make a comment. I'll take the chair and recognize you. Thank you, uh, Catherine, for pointing out. So the suggestion would be that the, um, although there are no animals uh, or people proposed for the function of the garage, it, uh, to get the doors open in the winter time, the roof does actually uh, serve a function to protect something from the elements, that being the doors, uh, the, the opening of the doors. That seems logical. Uh, I think, <clears throat> I think, from the my own personal opinion is from the details of the application. This is a 
a committed and conscientious owner who's really thought things out, and I'm happy to leave it to their discretion. I, I, I think the uh, suggestion is still a good one, even though the applicant may, may is just confirming really that from a heritage perspective, the porch is a little unusual, and that there's nothing, I think that's, it, it's a good idea to have that in the recommendation, but it, it, the fact that it's non-binding is the reason I'm going to support the recommendation. Thank you. And I return the chair. Any other comments? Okay, we'll call the vote on the amendment only. All those in favor? All those opposed? Uh, so that loses on a tie. So the amendment disappears. We're back to the uh, original recommendation. Where are we? I've mixed up my pages. Hang on a second. Yeah, so I've, I've actually already read the recommendation. Um, so if there's no further comments, uh, is there any further comments on the recommendation? So we will vote on the recommendation as in the package. All those in favor? Oppose? And that carries. Good luck with the work. Just give me one second to sort my pages. I've, I've mixed them up during that. So the next one is item two. It is 305 to 323 Rideau Street. <clears throat> and Ryan's going to do this as well, another part four. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, this is a part four uh, designation, and it's also subject to an easement agreement under part four, uh, which is registered with the City of Kingston. So this is the Bailey Broom Factory, which we all know and love, on the corner of Cataraqui and Rideau Streets. Uh, it is a former City of Kingston-owned property that was sold recently to the applicant, uh, and he and his team are intending to convert this former industrial building to a, uh, a cafe and office space. As I mentioned, it is designated and subject to an easement agreement. It was originally built for the Imperial Oil Company as a workshop in 1890s. Uh, the Bailey Broom Company bought the property in 1903 and, uh, and added the uh, new office addition, which was uh, done under plans by well-known architect William Newlands in 1909, and the concrete wing along uh, Rideau Street was added about the same time. Some of the attributes include that office addition section, as well as the brick wing and its, uh, its bays, its piers, its random coarse found, uh, stone foundation and the low slope to the, to the gable roof. So the application before us today is a substantial uh, renovation restoration uh, plan the, in order to, to facilitate the conversion of this former industrial building for other uses. So to go through each of these sections, the uh, I have the full set of plans, well the full set of plans are in your agenda package. Uh, I can bring them up on the screen if that's necessary, but I've, uh, for the purposes of, of time, I've uh, just included this rendering here as well. Um, and I understand the, uh, the applicant is, is with us today as well, so we can, we can benefit from her knowledge if, if necessary. So. Uh, so the application includes the restoration of the original 1894 brick wing, which is the wing along Cataraqui Street. That includes uh, substantial repointing, stabilization, and repairing of the brick walls that face the, the road itself. Uh, lengthening of two of the existing windows, which are the uh, westernmost windows uh, for the uh, sliding door cafe use. Uh, reconstructing the roof uh, in the same profile and adding solar panels to the, to the roof. The north side of this wing uh, is in an advanced stage of disrepair and it is to be uh, completely dismantled and rebuilt uh, with a metal um, siding. Uh, and, new, and new openings that match the same rhythm of, of bays as the, uh, as the roadside. 
The former office, uh, 1909 office edition at the corner, is to be completely repaired and, re uh, and restored, repointed. Uh, the parapet, cornice, downspout, doors, windows are all to be repaired uh, and, and used again, repainted as well. Uh, the roofing is to be, uh, the metal roofing is to be, uh, is to be replaced. Um, and of course, all the brick walls would be stabilized. The security door is to be removed, thankfully, and the uh, concrete stoop on uh, Rideau Street is to be replaced. The 1911 roughly um, concrete wing along Rideau Street uh, is to be uh, completely removed. Uh, the applicants are proposing to retain uh, approximately a meter of the wall in height along this street to be used as a, as a landscape feature. Uh, and to pay tribute to, uh, to that, that wing. A one-sided uh, metal uh, bicycle shelter is to be added immediately adjacent to that, uh, that retained wall. You can see that on the screen in the, in the central center uh, image. The, um, the, the roof, the design of this, of this bicycle structure is to, uh, is to replicate the, uh, the proportions of the, of the brick wing uh, in that area. And a series of landscaping is also proposed on this property, including patios and parking surfaces, new plantings and grass areas. And, uh, and as I said, the, the detailed um, uh, heritage impact statement, as well as the plans that were submitted by the applicant are in your agenda package for review. I would note uh, the application was submitted uh, with the plans to replace windows along the Cataraqui Street uh, wing. Uh, given the concerns that, uh, that both staff and this group uh, raised with the design of those windows, uh, and, the, and the applicants um, are still considering the, the exact uh, configuration of those last four windows, uh, they have been removed from this application before you today and will, uh, will be addressed through, uh, through a further application. So that has been pulled out and that is reflected in one of the conditions uh, of approval. Also, I should note, um, the applicants also own a, a portion of this property to the north, uh, which is currently vacant, uh, and they have play future plans for uh, townhouse uh, development on that, that portion of the land. Uh, that too has, is not part of today's application and will be addressed at a, a future permit stage. So in terms of our review, um, this was a, a complex and, uh, and multifaceted uh, application, so I will only hit sort of the high points. The, uh, the extensive program of restoration, recreation, and, and installation of the new features on this property uh, to allow this uh, a non-industrial use to, to function in this building uh, is, is definitely supportable. Um, the most culturally significant portion of the, the property is the brick wing along Cataraqui Street uh, and the Newlands Corner Office Edition. Uh, the Heritage Impact Statement uh, notes that the, uh, the office is uh, proposed to be repaired and restored, including all decorative architectural details the door with the transfer windows, the, uh, the roofing is to be replaced, uh, and we and we support uh, support all of that as it'll certainly um, improve that that landmark structure. There is a condition of approval noting that the the paint colors uh, are to be reviewed uh, by staff um, when they have uh, established exactly which ones. Uh, we understand they are to be a green tone similar to to what's there today. Uh, so the most significant change. Uh, to the public elevation, of course, is uh, is the Cataraqui, along Cataraqui Street is the lengthening of the two windows at the at the western end to accommodate the full length uh, patio style uh, windows. Um, the the width of the windows aren't changing the, currently. The length are just increased to the ground. The heritage impact statement that was submitted notes that the new doors will serve to meaningfully visually engage the cafe space uh, with the street and the community. Uh, and allow in natural light, uh, and in the consultant's opinion, will quote, not have a significant impact on the overall character, heritage character of the street, unquote. Staff concur with this statement uh, of the heritage consultant and uh, the plans to restore this highly visible, uh, the highly visible Newlands addition uh, and the changes proposed to this wing uh, will offset the impact of these changes up to these two openings. Uh, the, the designation bylaw notes the, the rhythm of the bays as a, as a heritage attribute. However, the windows themselves uh, are not noted as attributes. The addition, additionally, the presence on the street um, and improved access to this building could entice some more, more people to this area, hopefully, 
which could aid in creating a viable business that will then invest in maintaining and restoring this building in the future uh, for the long term. It will also expose more people to the history and character of this area, uh, and which includes a number of, of notable heritage buildings. Moving to the 1911 concrete wing on Rideau Street, uh, I would point out that it's not listed as a heritage attribute of the property. However, the wing plays an important role in understanding the history and evolution of this property from a workshop to a successful broom factory. The wing is also uh, in an advanced stage of, of deterioration and uh, was actually a little frightful to be standing inside of it at times. So uh, the applicant intends to demolish this concrete wing and, uh, and incorporate portions of it into the overall plans to form a bit of a commemoration and uh, to the history and the evolution uh, of the site. The, the wall uh, is proposed to be at a height of the former window sills and the um, and portions of the, of the wall uh, foundation will, re will remain and form part of the landscaping treatment uh, to reflect the, uh, the proportions of this building. Additionally, the, uh, the configuration of the shelter itself will follow the, the shape of the former, former wing as well to, again, pay tribute. So staff have no concerns with this proposal as it'll help showcase the culturally significant portions of the building while, uh, while tangibly um, paying tribute to the former industrial uh, building complex. The applicants have prepared an adaptive reuse plan that takes into account the heritage character, the existing conditions, and options for conservation of, this de of the designated attributes of this property uh, where they could. And upon review of all the submitted materials, staff uh, support this application uh, with the conditions outlined uh, in your report. So in terms of uh, the information we received from the circular agencies, uh, building notes that a building permit will be required Forestry, uh, of course, notes that um, tree removal and uh, will require a tree permit. Uh, Hydro Kingston uh, has noted that uh, the applicant is, needs to be aware that they have to retain a, a certain minimum distance from any power lines. Licensing has noted that a business license will be required. Uh, our parks development team has provided a few comments on the quality of the LED lighting, uh, as well as landscaping details. Um, and those, uh, those details will be further addressed in the, the site plan application, which is yet to come. Our, uh, our planning development team has noted that active applications for official plan, zoning amendment, and site plan control uh, are also have been submitted and are currently under review. Um, and then our real estate has noted that the applicants are still subject to the terms and agreements, terms and sections of the agreement of purchase and sale on this property. Uh, and they point out that new development uh, on the vacant parts of this land cannot proceed until uh, the existing building is restored and that's part of the, the agreement. So, and they have until uh, September of 2020 to complete that restoration work. So this committee also was circulated this application and, uh, and your comments are outlined in the agenda. Uh, one of the members noted, um, suggested the proposed knee wall be increased in height and that's the wall along Real Street. And uh, so we circulated that suggestion to the applicant who noted that uh, the concrete wall is in very poor condition and the new height was carefully established to, to minimize the risk uh, of further deterioration. Uh, it follows the height of the, the window sill uh, was, was their best uh, suggestion on, on the safest and, uh, and most appropriate height. So they would prefer to, to leave it um, as, as proposed. Uh, so Mr. Chair, our uh, recommendations, uh, the recommendation is before you. Uh, it actually takes up three pages, so we can flip back and forth, but uh, if you have any questions, uh, myself and the, and the um, heritage consultant for the applicant is here. Thanks. Thank you, Ryan. This is exciting. So I guess uh, at this point, it's questions to staff, members of the committee. Yes, Jane. Right. Um, I'm just a bit confused about the sliding. I, I don't have a problem with the enlarging the two existing windows on Cataraqui Street, but I do have a question about the sliding doors because on some of the plans, uh, the specifics of them, I guess, sometimes it looks like they're uh, opening out and sometimes they look like there's one slider. 
can I just want clarification on that and if staff is going to have some input because there doesn't seem to be any specifications you're going to enlarge it but we don't know what the doors are going to look like and I think that's a pretty important point on Cataraqui Street because it's going to be obvious from Rideau so maybe just some clarification on that. Can we get that question answered? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it's my understanding that they are standard sliding, horizontal sliding doors. I, th I believe they're aluminum, um, but the details, I, I don't know if Lindsay has, would like to comment on that? If you could just speak into a microphone, just so it, because this meeting is actually recorded and it need, the audio is part of it. Is that right? Thank you. Sorry, my name is Lindsay Reed. I'm the heritage consultant on this project. And just for everyone's background, I have been involved in this project since it was first put out to uh, the, the public for purchasing. Um, on that specific point, um, I'm just looking to the drawings right now. And it does show opening doors on the ground floor plan and the elevations. And I believe the conflict comes on um, the conservation plan where they're shown as sliding doors. Um, I'm afraid I don't know exactly uh, the, the answer to that question. My assumption would be that they are doors that open out, um, but there is a conflict in the drawings, and I would have to default to the lead architect on that for that conflict. So unfortunately, I don't have a true answer to your question. So I would suggest, uh, Jane, that you try, if you have a concern along that unanswered question, you have to tie, tie it to the recommendation and what we're going to be voting on, and, and if it needs to be addressed that way. Uh, if not, it can, it's a question that can be answered by, through follow-up through uh, staff. If it's, if it's relevant to your decision today, then you need to decide what you want to do. Staff, but if, if it says sliding, if we're re voting on sliding doors and they're going to be swing doors, isn't that... I think it just needs to be clarified. Okay, so maybe I'll ask staff, so, because uh, we're dealing with a hypothetical here. So if, in fact, the intention is sliding doors as opposed to opening doors, does the heritage permit as written, the recommendation as written, uh, is it able to accommodate the hypothetical or does it bind to one way or the other? So Mr. Chair, the recommendation uh, is pretty specific to sliding doors. Uh, that was my understanding of the application. I didn't catch the distinction that our member did, which is commendable, uh, but there is a, dis a uh, discrepancy on the landscape plan. So um, I would suggest perhaps just removing the term sliding, unless unless the committee has an, uh, per preference one way or another. Um, from our perspective, I don't think it particularly matters if they open or slide. So I would suggest just removing the word sliding doors uh, from, the, from the motion. Okay, so a quick pr procedural point. If you do think it matters that one way or the other and you favor sliding or another type of door, you, uh, you would not be in favor of removing the word sliding. And, uh, but for us to remove it, we would need to uh, have, we would need to have the committee's consent to remove that word. So maybe I'll just let you think about that for a minute. Uh, Councillor Shell, you want to say something? Well, I'm, I'm certainly happy to remove the word sliding. Yeah. So the, the actual 
recommendation isn't on the floor yet, but just think about it uh, when it comes up. If we approve it as is, then they're bound to sliding doors. Okay, thanks for pointing that out, Jane, and we'll continue with the application and uh, discussion. We're still in questions, anyone else? Questions, questions only, because it's not on the floor yet. Yes, Catherine. Uh, is the intention that the doors um, and the windows um, actually look appropriate, you know, so in other words, that you're actually looking at the question of the windows in relation to the question of the doors. Um, so, because there was the comment about them being commercial doors. And so, you know, I mean, I think that it's important that when you look down Kataraqui Street that everything looks appropriate. It doesn't seem to me that a sliding door would be appropriate but not knowing what the windows are going to look like, it's difficult to kind of say anything about the door. So, the so what is your question to staff? What do, you, what do you need to know to help clarify? I need to know what the windows are going to look like um, before commenting on the doors. Okay, so there's a question about the windows on Cataraqui Street. Who would like to take that question? I think, thank you, Mr. Chair. It's a, it's a good point. Um, certainly the, the configuration and design of the windows will be brought back uh, at a, at a, with a different permit, so they will be looked at separately. Um, the, I think the doors that we had reviewed uh, for this application were pretty simple, nondescript sliding doors. They were, um, but it's a good point, and uh, I don't have an answer for you at this point. So perhaps, uh, did you want to weigh in, Lindsay? I... Um, so I think when this application was reviewed last fall, the intention that we had at that point in time is that all of the windows um, would be dropped down to ground level to bring in lots of light as kind of the adaptive reuse of this space. Um, when we made our application for the heritage permit, because we have concern um, about the deteriorating condition of the building, especially this particular wing, um, we did a walk around with staff and at that time there was a request from staff of whether or not some of the window openings could be retained. Um, unfortunately, the existing windows that are there right now, most of them are missing and the few that are there are absolutely, unfortunately, beyond repair. Um, so given the short amount of time, we, we haven't been able to come up with the window design that we're completely um, satisfied with, um, given the kind of the modern construction uh, that's available for this. And we have um, your concern as well that we want to make sure that the windows and the doors on this side, you know, read of the same time and the same element. Um, so it's just trying to find that balance between the two. Um, in terms of moving forward today, so we can <laughs> so we can actually work on the masonry and repairs, um, if if need be. I don't think there would be an objection to parceling out both the windows and the doors on that elevation, um, just so that everyone felt completely satisfied, ourselves as well, um, that it was doing the best service to this elevation. But I will leave that to yourselves to pursue. Okay, thank you. As we're in questions, and, uh, and I think we've identified a, an issue here so I'll put it to staff for the purposes of ex expediting up the rest of the permit. Would it be, would it make sense to withdraw the, the one recommendation that contains the, the, this, this aspect and uh, continuing on with the rest of the application and have staff deal with the window and door design once it's been proposed by the applicant? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm glad the, the consultant was able to 
to suggest this because that was going through my head as well. Is I think it might be uh, might be simpler to uh, to deal with the design of the doors and windows together, uh, as the member suggested. So there is a condition uh, number. Number nine in, in the recommendation, which deals um, specifically to uh, pulling the uh, specifics of the windows out of this particular approval. So perhaps adding, um, adding windows and doors along, um, along the brick wing facing Cataraqui Street uh, to that particular condition uh, would pull that out and then perhaps um, removing reference to it in uh, in uh, note number one in the motion as well. That way we can deal with both the doors and windows separately. Um. Thank you. So you'll see, just so everyone's clear, in the recommendation, the very first uh, alteration is the, is the longest one, and it goes over, over the page if you're looking at the beginning package. So the, the element that's relevant to this discussion is the, it says create sliding doors slash full length windows. So that would be removed and in under condition number nine, there's two things. Yeah, so, um, so the, the sentence after the semicolon right before the end of the page on page three of the package. It says enlarging two existing windows along Cataraqui Street to create sliding doors slash full length windows. So that sentence would be removed in its entirety, I guess? I would suggest, Mr. Chair, that we only remove reference to the inserting of the, the windows and doors. Uh, the applicants are anxious to get out and start doing some work to that brick wall because it is in an active state of deterioration. And, uh, and I think if we can uh, support the lengthening of the windows at this particular time, um, which we're comfortable with as staff, uh, and then the details of the actual windows and doors to go into those openings uh, can be addressed okay, so at just a separate. To create them. So really just removing the last part of the sentence, to create sliding doors slash full length windows, or just to create sliding doors? Like, do you need to leave the full-length windows in that sentence? Uh, Mr. Chair, I would suggest um, stopping the semicolon after Cataraqui Catar Street and just enlarging the existing windows along Cataraqui Street and just delete. Okay, so deleting from to create sliding doors slash full-length windows. Correct. Okay, and that is staff's recommendation and the second part would be to um, add the word doors and before windows in condition number nine. Is that right? Okay, so that is uh, a change to the recommendation. We need an amendment, we'll need an amendment for that, right? Yeah, okay, so we're still in questions, so there will be an amendment when we come to discussion. Maybe uh, someone from staff can work on the, that, what we just uh, said verbally to, so that the clerk can have it, the clerk. Yeah, okay. So we'll keep moving. Any other questions from members of the committee? Okay, members of the public have a chance to ask questions or make comments. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the excellent presentation and the really thorough package um, with the report. Um, seeing photographs from inside the building for the, for the first time, so it's very interesting. Um, so I have, have one sort of technical uh, related point that's sort of confusing and then some suggestions. Um, looking at the first condition where it says, reconstructing the roof in the same profile as the existing roof. Now I was by there a little while ago the existing roof is sagging, so you wouldn't actually want to, to recreate the roof in the sagging profile. You would want to put it back the way it was, right? Seems to me. So perhaps that's a wording change or I think the meaning is clear. You know, you want to uh, restore the building, but you would, don't want to have it in the way it is now. It's just, it's, you know, like that, as you would think. 
after a lot of years of not being used, right? So, okay, second point. Um, I'm concerned about the floors and what you may be finding there uh, as you start reconstructing. Um, you may be discovering new facts that are going to impact where, where you're going on this. And maybe some brownfield elements, right? It was a manufacturing site for, you know, 60, 70, 80 years. You're going to have chemicals and tar and that kind of thing. So um, I just wanted on the record that that needs to be understood. Um, okay, so my next point it has to do with the windows, but not necessarily in the context that you're talking about already. Um, and I seem, I'm, at least I'm a little bit confused. I, I do support the enlarged windows to start with, I think from the point of view of functionality and also maybe going higher, right, to allow more light in. I think that's important. It's fairly large building and there's not a lot of windows and you want to have light in so it's usable as possible. And where I'm confused um, has to do with condition number two where it says rebuild the north side of the brick wing, north elevation, clad in pre-finished metal siding. Not so sure if it's like that. Um, it seems that you would want to um, rebuild it with the brick that's already there. The brick seem, it seems to be in reasonable shape with the photographs that we have now. It's the first time we had a chance to evaluate that. You're doing the south facing section of Catarockway Street that's brick and you're going to stay with brick. So I support that. That's great. But I'd like to see the entire Catarockway Street wing be consistently restored. And it seems that the condition of the brick doesn't vary from one area to the other. I didn't go around behind as it's private property, but from the photographs I could see on Calarco Street. So that would be my um, request to do that. And let me see. I think that's it. So, I'm not sure if that enters into the discussion of what the committee wants to look at, but... Thank you, thank you Mr. Dixon. Any other members of the public? Seeing none, uh, staff has a chance to respond to the member of the public uh, and any questions that he posed. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the, the matter of the uh, contamination, I believe, will be dealt with separately from this process. Um, I'm not familiar with those details, but that is outside of the scope of what we're doing today. Uh, the, the north side of the brick wing is, was certainly a challenge for staff, uh, and I'm sure it was a challenge for the applicant as well. Um, the pictures may be deceiving, but uh, that, that wall is in really bad shape. And if there are any bricks left, they'd be very few and far between to be able to rebuild in brick. Uh, so it would essentially be a new wall and, uh, and the applicants are trying to, the way I understood anyway, the application is the applicants are trying to blend the new and the old to show a new evolution of this building. And uh, given it's not a prominent facade of the building, um, and given that they're proposing to do a number of restoration projects that are prominent, um, and they're retaining the same form and shape of the roof and the building itself, uh, we were supportive of the metal uh, on the north side. Thank you for that. Okay, so we need a mover and a seconder for the recommendation. Moved by Mac, seconded by Don. So, the recommendation's on the floor. Um, let's deal with the uh, suggestion from staff that we uh, remove the sliding door from the recommendation and add it to the one condition that is saying a heritage permit shall be obtained outside the scope of this approval for any alterations to the doors and windows on the brick wing facing Cataraqui Street. So that would be a change to uh, condition number nine. So we need an amendment uh, to that effect. Do you have it ready, Mr. Clerk? Yep, so in the first clause in the sentence dealing or starting with the word enlarging, um, that sentence will finish at Cataraqui Street and then things will pick up again after the semicolon at reconstructing. And then in condition nine, 
Um, doors will be added before they will say doors and windows instead of just windows. Can I get a mover for this amendment? Move by Mac, second by Catherine. Any discussion? We've pretty much already had the discussion in question period, so uh, all those in favor? Opposed? And that carries. So, the amended recommendation, any discussion? Yes, Don. This is <coughs> certainly a very challenging project, and it's uh, wonderful that um, applicants are going ahead with uh, this, the, these plans, which look very good to me. You know, given the condition of the buildings and uh, uh, what they're trying to do, I think it's quite reasonable to give them some slack, you might call it, uh, uh, at the north wall and uh, some of the other less visible parts of the building. So I have no concerns about the application. Thank you. Mr. Vice Chair, will you take the chair so I can make a comment? Yes, you have the floor. Thank you. I uh, support the recommendation. I wanted to highlight a few areas for the applicant uh, to make sure they understand their importance in the bigger, bigger picture. So first of all, absolutely um, uh, very, very happy about the bicycle shelter. And the reason for this is because of the location of, of, of the Bailey Broom. So the Bailey Broom, and it's not just because I'm a cyclist, uh, the, the Bailey Broom is uh, located in, in, a, in a crucial point in the North Kingstown area. And the, the, the whole point of the whole North Kingstown revitalization project and, and all that work that went into the study was to repurpose a lot of these uh, sort of derelict uh, lands and properties and, and cre create sort of a new commercial hub and, and associated lands building on the success of the river mill and, and a crucial part of that is access to these places for the residents nearby and the residents in that area are very much into active transportation. So walking, pedestrian and, and cycling are the, are the primary modes for the residents in North Kingstown. So absolutely that that priority needs to be there. So they've recognized this with the creation of a bicycle shelter, which I think will be really uh, a nice feature. On top of that, the landscaping treatment of the Rideau Street, which is the more visible street, will be important. Of course, they were demolishing that whole wing, so, uh, and that'll be sort of rebuilt, demolished land. So that is very important that the landscape plan be inviting to pedestrians and cyclists. And then the, um, uh, you know, it says that in the, in the report about a more pedestrian-friendly environment. I just wanted to stress that. And the last point would be the trees. So uh, from the forestry department, uh, they're talking about the tree permit. Well, that's a procedural thing that needs to be done. I would say replacement trees. I would say because that, that north side of the property is, is fairly open, one of the things that will invite pedestrian traffic into the space would be actually tree cover. And it takes several years for trees to grow. So maybe consider maximizing the amount of trees that can be placed. And if there are any trees that can be retained and incorporated in the design, then that saves you several years waiting for the trees to grow. So I just wanted to highlight those aspects of the livability. And I believe the applicant has already shown through their design that they're committed to these uh, values that are especially important to the residents of that area. Thank you. Returning the chair. Okay, uh, anyone else wish to comment before we vote? So we will uh, vote on the amended recommendation. All those in favor? Opposed? That carries unanimously. Good luck with your work. Thank you. So we're on to item number three, another uh, heritage permit. This one is 85 Stewart Street, which is the Theological Hall, I think, on Queen's University. Correct. And it looks like Alex has this one. Okay. Good morning. So an application for alteration under 37 of the Act is before us. Um, the subject property is part of the main campus at the Queen's University, which contains a number of prominent 19th and 20th century heritage buildings. The subject property at 85 Stewart Street is located north of Stewart Street, 
between University Avenue and Arch Street. The property contains um, Theological Hall, otherwise known as the Old Arts Building, um, which is a two-story limestone building with a third-story attic under a gabled roof. So the, um, the main campus of the university is subject to a heritage easement agreement which was enacted in 1998 under uh, part four of the act. Um, Theological Hall um, is included as a building of heritage value and the heritage character statements in the agreement rate this building as excellent. It was built in 1880 to designs by Gordon and Halliwell, which were Toronto architects. It was the third building constructed for Queen's University, um, but the first building constructed in Principal Grant's campaign to make uh, the university a nationally recognized arts university. It was also the first uh, of the Romanesque revival buildings on campus. Um, Convocation Hall, which is on the interior, um, was the first large public meeting hall at Queen's. So, um, the character defining elements um, include the following the symmetrical Roma Romanesque revival style, the hierarchy of window types at each story, the central tower, the design of the vertical window openings with the horizontal band courses, um, and the surviving original materials, which include local limestone, wood, copper, iron, and slate. So the application before us uh, is to gain approval to remove a basement window on the north elevation of convocation, or sorry, of theological hall, and to root a new duct through the window to an outside mechanical unit. Correspondingly, the application proposes a painted wood and steel enclosure, um, which is intended to house the mechanical unit and relocated waste receptacles that are currently uh, haphazardly placed around the building. Detailed plans were prepared by Congat's architects and they were submitted in support of this application. This application is part of a larger renovation project to Convocation Hall, which is on the interior. Um, so, but at this point, uh, the application simply re relates those exterior elements as Convocation Hall is not included um, in the easement agreement. So the basement window that is being removed um, is located on the eastern half of the north elevation of the of Theological Hall. The window itself is hard to view as it's within a window well um, and it's capped with a metal grill. However, the window, looking through the window, does not appear to be original or period. Additionally, this window is not even visible from grade. The applicant and the architect have explored many options for rooting the ducting of the mechanical work to minimize the impact on the cultural heritage value of the building. And as a result, this proposal represents the preferred option as um, it adheres to best practice in terms of minimal intervention, reversibility, and it's far more desirable than penetrating through the um, original limestone walls. The location of the duct through the basement window also allows for the consolidation of nearby waste receptacles and the new mechanical unit within a, an enclosure. And you can see on the screen the approximate location in relation to this elevation of the building. Um, at the site visit, staff and the applicant discussed the possibility of adjusting the, um, the, the location of this uh, enclosure slightly to the east, such that the uh, west corner and the buttress of the wing containing Convocation Hall wouldn't be obscured. Um, the applicant agreed to investigate this, opportun this uh, option and did, did manage to shift it ever so slightly um, in so far as the corner of the building is now still defined as you view it from the north. Um, staff feel that the consolidation of these waste receptacles in their enclosures is an improvement to the current setting of Theological Hall um, and given and, and basically outweighs the visual impact of the fact that this enclosure will obscure a, a portion of that wall. In reviewing um, Parks Canada's standards and guidelines, uh, the application satisfied the following standards. Standard three, which is to conserve heritage value by adopting approach for minimal intervention as well as standard 11, which is to create any new additions or related new construction so that the essential form and integrity of a historic place will not be impaired if the new work is removed in the future. Um, I just want to also um, note the reversibility of this application. So if at any, any time in the future the duct or the steel enclosure remo were removed, the form and integrity of the theological hall would not be harmed. We did consult the heritage, I'm just gonna bring up the elevation as well. We did consult the heritage committee and no concerns were expressed, however we did have Two committee members spoke to, um, commented on the color for the enclosure, um, and so far as its color should be selected so as to minimize its impact on the building. Um, the proposal at per, at cur uh, currently is for a sort of medium gray color, um, and we have included a condition to um, review the final color selection. So staff recommend um, approval of this application as we have not received any objections um, from a built heritage perspective, and we haven't had any concerns raised by internal departments. So the recommendation is before you. Thank you. Questions from members of the committee? Jane. 
I just wondered um, about the height of the garbage, the height of the enclosure. It's pretty high, and it's something I didn't notice before when I was submitting my Heritage Kingston review. It's like eight feet six inches, and I'm thinking if it is in, it's enclosing um, sort of an HVAC thing and garbage cans, but are they all a standard height, and is it possible to reduce the height like step it down a bit. I don't really, you can't tell that from the plans, the act, what they're actually trying to hide in this enclosure, so. Does staff know um, the rationale for the height of eight foot six inches? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I assume that it is in relation to the height of the waste receptacles as well as how the mechanical unit is probably likely mounted on some sort of a, uh, foundation, but I will, I do have the um, applicants here from the university, so if we want to just confirm the necessity of the height, I'm happy to, to anyone, ask them to come up. Anyone here from Queens wish to speak to the height of the closures or any way it can be reduced, or is there, is it, uh, is that already minimized to the, the smallest it can be? Thank you, and through you, Mr. Chair. Um, at this time, we don't have the mechanical drawings with us um, to verify if it could be reduced. We believe that the height selected is the height that would be the, the minimum required, but we can verify with those drawings and uh, come back to staff and let them know if they can be reduced, and if they can, we'd make every effort to do so. So the, um, the recommendation itself doesn't specify the height, so, and staff does have to re review the final design, so I uh, just can get a confirmation from staff that the height will be dealt with when we see the final design? That is correct. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Any other questions? Okay, we'll move to the recommendation. Uh, sorry, members of the public have a chance to speak to the item before we go to recommendation. Seeing none. So the recommendation is a description of the work, two points, and then one condition. Um, just to point out the nature of this particular permit, it, it, the work being proposed is not heritage, has no heritage value, and, the, and our decision is, is whether it is an acceptable non-heritage element uh, given the heritage nature of the building and the heritage easement that exists. It's a fairly simple question, it's, and it's kind of a yes or no question. So um, with that said, I need a mover and a seconder for the recommendation. Moved by Catherine, seconded by Councillor Schell. Any discussion on the recommendation? And we'll, yes, Don. Uh, <clears throat> I certainly am a little concerned about the height. As uh, Jane mentioned, I didn't realize it was meant to be as high as eight feet. And I'm satisfied that they will uh, to review that and minimize it if possible. I wonder even if they could consider going underground to some extent and just reducing the, the whole uh, impact, you know, the whole size of the uh, enclosure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, I'm going to make my comment just as chair that. Um, we understand, I think everyone here at the committee understands that modernizing alterations like this will occur on heritage buildings. Uh, and this is an example of one. That, and the goal is to minimize the impact of the modernizing element as much as possible. So not just the height, but if there's any, just as you're doing it, just and going forward on other buildings, minimizing the impact on the building is the primary concern of this committee. Thank you. So, I guess we will vote on the recommendation. All those in favor? Opposed, and that carries unanimously. Good luck, and uh, staff will follow up. The next item in your package has actually been withdrawn by staff. Uh, there's further uh, technical uh, review needs to be completed. Uh, number five, 58 William Street is the next item. Yes, so everything, the rest of the permits are all part five. So part five uh, procedures now will apply, and uh, I'll remind you as they come up. Go ahead, Alex. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So an application for alteration under section 42 of the act is before us. Um, oh, sorry. Wrong papers.
same section, same application for um, alteration. However, it has been submitted to demolish a rear greenhouse addition and to construct a rear new addition um, on the existing building footprint. Additionally, the application is seeking approval to remove non-period metal shutters and install wood louvered shutters. So 50 William Street is located on the south side of William Street, east of Wellington. The subject property forms part of a two-story, uh, two-and-a-half-story stone, sorry, two-and-a-half-story brick terrace constructed in 1854. Um, so it was designated as part of the old Sydenham Heritage District in 2015. It is rated as significant to the district. Um, in, it was, when it was constructed in 1854, it forms part of a terrace that stretches from 56 to 60 William Street. Um, the property inventory evaluation form notes the terrace as having design and contextual values and being well suited to the southwest side of William Street, which is comprised of several stone and brick houses with compatible massing, flat facades, side gable roofs, and similar setbacks. So this heritage application addresses the demolition of the existing um, rear greenhouse addition and the construction of a new porch. Um, as proposed, um, this existing rear, or sorry, as existing, um, the greenhouse addition does not appear to be an historic structure. It is constructed of a simple and unadorned metal frame with large glazing panels. Um, the structure does not complement the architectural style of the original building or the composition of the house. And it's, for example, um, its location actually obscures a ground floor window. And it is in very poor condition with many broken panes of glass and consequently staff have no objection uh, to its demolition. As proposed, um, the design of the new rear porch addition complies with the policies and design guidelines within the old Sidham district, specifically sections 5.2.2 additions and 5.41 general. Um, the rear porch is located away from the main street facade at the rear and is clearly secondary in terms of its size. Um, the proportions of the structure and frame and the window door openings and detailing are complementary to the architectural composition of this elevation, but are also distinguishable in form and detail. Um, the proposed colors for the rear porch addition, including the window trim, uh, siding, um, have been noted in the drawings, uh, and staff have included a condition to finalize that color selection. The proposed materials include uh, painted wood for the structure and frame, a painted uh, fiber cement board for the cladding, iron or steel railings on the balcony, wood decking on the balcony, and a steel roof over the lower portion of the addition. These materials do comply with the relevant guidelines in the district plan. And the proposed materials are compatible, um, but do provide a nice distinction between the original building and the new addition. Um, I just want to point out that section 5.2.2 speaks to um, uh, notes that construction of additions should not entail removal, covering, or other adverse impacts on heritage attributes or important architectural features of the house. Um, and in this case, the addition will conceal um, that same window that the greenhouse addition was concealing on the ground floor. Um, it has been partially covered over, um, but the existing window at the interior landing level will, will remain fully exposed and not impacted by the addition. And ultimately, if this, the addition doesn't cause any in, in irreversible change because ultimately if it was removed, that window could be exposed in the future. Um, the new windows and doors on the porch addition are proposed to be metal clad aluminum, um, which in their design um, all comply with the section on windows in the plan, as well as with the city's policy on window renovations. Um, there is a change in the lengthening of the window on the second floor of the, of the addition, um, or of the house, and that is to accommodate uh, access to the new balcony above the addition. So uh, French doors are proposed. Um, the proposal does impact this original window opening, however, it does uh, comply with section 5.3.2, which speaks to um, alterations to window openings uh, being um, not facing or visible from the street. Um, additionally, the preservation of the width of the window um, will ensure that the window maintains the general proportions and appearance of the other tall sash windows on the back elevation. Um, on the front elevation of the house, uh, the applicant's proposing to, to remove the um, non-period metal shutters. Um, they wish to install a um, more appropriate um, wood louvered shutter. There is existing uh, historic hardware for shutters on the front elevation of this pro property, and the applicant wants to either use salvaged uh, period appropriate shutters or um, install new wood louvered shutters. Um, 
In terms of our consultation with the committee, um, we did get some comments that they needed additional information with regards to materials and colors, and that was largely to do with um, window materials and siding. So we subsequently received that information and recirculated it to the group so everyone had that provided to them. Um, otherwise, we didn't receive any concerns. So um, staff recommend approval of uh, this application before you as there are no objections from a built heritage perspective and no concerns have been raised by internal departments or the committee. Thank you. So part five process, uh, Jane and Don, thank you for your diligence on commenting on pretty much every application through DASH. Uh, were your comments captured accurately? Okay, and I guess your concerns were addressed in b between that point and now, so that's great. That's the way it's supposed to work. Uh, the next item is uh, members of the public are permitted to add comments to the file. Seeing none, uh, the final part is yes or no to the recommendation. Keeping in mind, we're judging it against the Heritage District plan and the language therein. So, uh, the recommendation from staff is that we uh, grant this, that we uh, recommend to council, right? So, the Heritage Kingston supports council's approval of the following. Council is a decision body with part five. And it's got the four uh, parts of the work and three conditions. So, uh, who wants to move? It needs to be moved and seconded. Moved by Council Shell, seconded by Catherine. So, uh, final comments can be added to the file at this point. Yes, Catherine. Um, and this just relates to the shutters at the front of the building. So, I just wanted to commend um, the applicants for actually doing that <laughs> because the, whether they're now um, are clearly not appropriate. Uh, and just um, to ensure that the shutters, the replacement shutters are actually operational shutters as opposed to just fixed to the building. That's all. Thank you. Clerk has taken note of that comment. Any other comments? Don? It's really not part of the application, but uh, when I tried to go, well, when I went by to look at the house, you really can't see the front of the house because it's totally concealed by trees. I think at least one of those trees could be removed and imp much improve the street view. Comment is included. Not subject to this application, of course. Um, any other comments? Okay, we'll vote on the recommendation. All those in favor? Opposed? That carries unanimously. Good luck. Next is 81 Gore Street. Sorry, did I skip one? Yes, that's the page, that's the page I'm missing. Sorry, there's still two, there's still two uh, others before we get to 81 Gore Street. So 221 King Street East, which is for not Club Inn. Mm -mm. Uh, no, it's not? It's not, well that's not the Frontenac Club Inn. Oh, <laughs> But it okay. is 221 King Street East that we're speaking about. Okay, <laughs> I uh, stand corrected. You're Go close, ahead. 225. <laughs> Okay, so an application, again, under section 42, which is the part five designation under the act, has been submitted to gain approval for, to erect a two and a half uh, meter high ground sign in the front yard of the property at 221 King Street East, which is very close to the Frontenac Club at 225. So 221 King is located on the northeast corner of King and Earl Streets in the old Sydenham HCD. The subject property contains a two and one half story stone square building. Um, so the subject property was designated under part four of the act in 1976, um, and again under part five of the act in 2015 as part of the old Sydney HCD. The property is rated as significant to the district. It was constructed in 1834 for John Solomon Cartwright, who was a prominent lawyer, judge, and banker, and also a member of the Legislative Assembly of Upper Canada. Um, the building is highly, has a highly individualized character through the unique handling of planes and textures and details. Um, the 
The bylaw and uh, property inventory form also note the regularly coursed limestone, which comprises the main wall services, um, in combination with the furrowed ashlar for the coins and the window surrounds and basement and uh, corner projections. So this play of strong forms in the coins and string courses is quite evident on the King Street facade. The uh, property also has four um, large chimneys, two on each sides of the roof. So 221 King Street East is a, is a residential building which has been adapted for sort of commercial, professional business uses. Um, and the proposed sign is intended to advertise the businesses within the building. Uh, the location for the sign is on the south half of the front yard, uh, set back three meters from the front boundary wall. The proposed sign is uh, two and a half meters tall and will be constructed of wood, painted in light gray and black. Um, and the individual business names will be black lettering on white black vinyl, uh, but no lighting is proposed as part of this application. So the old Sydenham plan does not um, actually provide any design guidelines per se for commercial signage. Uh, however, the subject property is located within the King Street Corridor, um, which is described as a ceremonial, en ceremonial entrance to the downtown in the plan. And as such, any alterations to this property should conserve the attributes um, ascribed to the corridor. Historically and architecturally, the building is a residential building. Um, however, we know that it's been used for small business and professional offices for a long time, as this is noted in uh, volume two of Buildings of Architectural and Historical Significance, which was published in 1973. Um, so as such, um, appropriately designed signage that conserves the value and attributes of the property and would allow the continuing adaptive use of this property would, would be supportive of, um, of section 2.5.2 heritage uh, buildings, the goal which states fostering continued use of heritage buildings. Um, in terms of supporting information, the applicant did provide an example of um, of another sign that they have designed and installed within the old Sydenham Heritage Conservation District. So we do have a good sense of um, what we can expect in terms of quality. Um, so the proportions and scale of the proposed sign, which I can go back to, is um, well illustrated and um, will provide unobstructed sight lines to the building, will not detract from the prominence of the building, and moreover, the proposed colors of light gray, black, and white won't compete, but rather complement the, the limestone building. Um, there is a small component of plastic being used um, for the, where the names slot in on the sign. However, um, we feel this will have a negligible, negligible impact considering the whole sign is painted wood, including the large face of the sign. Um, and it's worth noting that in terms of um, our comments from committee members, um, they had a few questions that we clarified, but um, one, which, one significant change which um, was addressed from their comments was that the actual uh, sign board was originally proposed to be plastic is now wood, and it is just simply the names slotted in that are plastic. So, um, uh, Steph, I'm gonna present the recommendation before you, which is to approve this application and subject to a sign permit being obtained. Thank you. Thank you. So, part five, again, uh, two members, Jane and Don, made the comments in Dash, were they correctly included? Yes. And uh, now we go to members of the public for comments. Remember, that the only thing we're considering today is the sign itself. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to propose a improvement that the sign, when it's built, contains some heritage information on the building. Um, so very interesting in the report. Um, I think that's very significant. Um, this is from like prior to the formation of the city of Kingston. And we had somebody who I'd never heard of serving as an MLA. Um, so that's valuable information. So that's my suggestion. Um, I guess we may take it uh, as it is. That has been recorded by the clerk. Any other members of the public? So the, just so you know, in this process, if you are the applicant, this is the section you can make comments. You can't make comments at other times. Okay, so we move to the recommendation. Um, so it's uh, for the installation of the sign, and there's one condition that a sign permit shall be obtained. I need a mover and a seconder. Moved by Councillor Schell. 
Second by Don. Any final comments for the record? Jane. I'd just like to say that I would like um, the person who's making the sign to reconsider the pressure treated planking for the roof, just because the profile of pressure treated is slightly rounded and something a regular wood plank would be less roundy looking. Uh, like I have no problem with pressure treated for the support post, but um, the example of that was given here, that's not, I'm pretty sure that's not pressure treated wood on that sign. I would say, anyway, I'm just, this is uh, just a comment that they should reconsider and use something that's got a sharper looking profile for the top, that's all. Com the comment was uh, captured by the clerk. Any other final comments? Mac. I think the, the, uh, the five quarter by six decking pressure treat is rounded, but standard pressure treated, I'm not saying the used pressure treat this may or nay, but the standard pressure treat is square like all the rest of the lumber. It's just that decking you see a lot of is always rounded. That comment has been also recorded by the clerk. Anyone else? Okay, so that Heritage Kingston supports council's approval. So it's our recommendation to council. All those in favor? Opposed, and that carries unanimously. Thank you, good luck. I've got my package sorted now, so I know that our next one is 200 Ontario Street. <laughs> There is a, an application for Fondant Club in, in this package, and because I had the wrong page. <laughs> but anyway, we'll get to that very soon, hopefully, as time is ticking away. Uh, if staff could just be aware in your presentations that we, um, we have less than an hour before we lose quorum. do my best to be as expeditious as possible, Mr. Chair. I'm sure everyone knows this property. This is the uh, Prince George Hotel, uh, home of the Tiernan Oak Restaurant on the corner of Ontario Market and Clarence Street. Uh, it's one of the oldest stone structures in the city. Uh, and it includes uh, the, the wing on Market Street, uh, which is 6 through 14 Market Street, as well as the, uh, the lower additions, brick additions on Clarence Street. It has a significant cultural heritage value within the city. It, is, it, it was a Part 4 designation at the time of the Market Square plan. That designation was lifted and it was included in the Market Square Heritage District. It's also subject to a, a heritage conservation easement agreement with the Ontario Heritage Trust under part two of the, uh, of the act. Uh, it has association with the Herkimer family who are well-known UELs in this area as well as uh, a number of notable um, architects. Uh, and it was a number of, of uh, buildings and was the Prince George Hotel as early as 1918. Uh, it's a landmark downtown and it's uh, a heritage attributes on three sides of the building. And, uh, and its scale and fenestration and whatnot are included as attributes of the uh, district plan itself. So what is before this committee today uh, is a proposal to rebrand the Tiernan Oak restaurant uh, to Darcy's Bar and Grill. Uh, it's, this includes a series of alterations to the, all three facades of this building. The Ontario Street facade, which is before you on the screen, uh, includes the replacement of uh, two mast arm signs using the same sign bracket but new signage. I would note, uh, as you will, we go through these slides, you'll see the painting that uh, is also proposed, but it is, um, it is under discussion at this point, and the applicants have agreed to remove um, the painting at this point from their application, so that will be addressed separately. Uh, and it's not subject for today's, uh, today's application. In terms of the Market Street side, uh, the applicants are proposing to remove the black awnings along this, uh, the stretch, uh, repairing the double doors at the far west end, in, uh, installing, or sorry, repairing them if they can or restoring new ones uh, to allow uh, a main entrance into the restaurant space from that area. Uh, a new um, 
hooded um, cover will be uh, structure will be added over that entrance with signage. Uh, the the remaining doors, uh, one blinded and two uh, are, un, are not functional, are to be uh, to be blinded with a, a wood uh, treatment um, and used for signage and and, uh, and used to uh, to stop um, access. Uh, we in discussions with uh, with the applicants, they have brought that forward to match up with the former entrances that were have been removed some time ago and to uh, retain and repair the transoms which are hidden by the awnings uh, but are still extant. Uh, the, there is one sign along here. You can see the little Guinness sign. Uh, it is to be reused but relocated further to the east. On the Clarence Street elevation, uh, the applicant's proposing to clean all the brick and do and repointing. Uh, the uh, current blinded window opening on this facade um, is to have a, some new signage in, uh, painted into it. The openings on the one-story uh, brick wing furthest to the west uh, is to be opened for a very free access as well as two roll-away garage door type windows to, uh, to allow a patio indoor-outdoor space along that stretch. The wooden fence uh, between the one and two story brick additions is to be replaced with a, a replica of the St. James Gate Brewery uh, fence uh, in a black uh, arched uh, design. There's also some uh, exterior lighting and, uh, and some minor uh, changes to, the, uh, to hide the wiring along that stretch. Detailed plans are included in your agenda package. Uh, I haven't brought them all up on the screen, but they are available uh, if, uh, if you're interested. And, uh, and they are, as I said, they are provided in your agenda package. So in terms of our review, uh, staff have assessed this against the Market Square District Plan and the standards and guidelines of the uh, from Parks Canada. Uh, the Market Square Plan uh, notes that new materials uh, that are introduced shall be physically and visibly, visually uh, compatible uh, with it, the district's heritage attributes, uh, and that uh, it also states that reflective glass or glossy materials should be avoided. Uh, the majority of the alterations, as I noted, are in wood, um, including the new doors and canopies, uh, as well as the, uh, the Guinness replica gate. The barrier-free door and the roll-up garage will be uh, black aluminum, uh, and it's, we note that uh, that given that the Clarence Street uh, addition is on a secondary facade uh, and a later addition to the building set back uh, from the three-story limestone uh, landmark structure on, the, on Ontario Street, the new metal garage doors will not compete or detract from the, the character of the, the building. Uh, further, black metal, as you're well aware, is used extensively throughout the district and downtown as a, as a complementary um, material on uh, on street lighting, patios, furnitures, uh, fencing, and whatnot, uh, and staff have no concerns with the use of it in this context. Changes to the openings uh, in that brick addition on Clarence Street uh, are typically not uh, encouraged. However, neither, neither the, uh, of the openings along this facade are probably original. They're one blinded window, perhaps, and, uh, and the door uh, arguably could be. Um, but this, this particular structure has seen a number of alterations over, over, its, uh, over its time uh, to accommodate the needs uh, of its tenants. Um, the large blinded window uh, is to be retained and used for signage. The existing door and transom uh, are in relatively poor condition uh, and will be a large for barrier-free access. Uh, the eastern portion of the elevation uh, is to be opened in order to accommodate those new uh, aluminum garage doors uh, for an indoor outdoor space. Uh, but we would note that the existing uh, brick pilasters uh, are to be retained. Uh, similarly, the voussoirs and keystones and the brick dentils above are also to be retained to reflect those, uh, those former openings on the, on the one-story addition. Um, so with this elevation, of course, does not face Market Square. So it's, it will have little impact on the character of the district itself. Uh, Clarence Street uh, has, has significant heritage character in its own right. Uh, all the properties along this stretch are on the heritage register in some form. Uh, the new garage doors will bring more uh, street presence to this area on a year-round basis and allow more people to experience and appreciate that heritage character of, of not only the hotel itself, but, uh, 
but the adjacent heritage buildings on Clarence Street. Uh, the proposed alterations uh, retain what is left of the fenestration pattern on the building and will have a positive impact on the character of the area. The applicants have uh, reviewed the character and existing conditions and detailings uh, and discussed uh, preliminary plans with staff at this point and have, uh, have prepared an adapt or reuse plan that takes these elements into consideration. So upon review of the applicable policies, we support this, this application subject to the conditions outlined. In terms of agencies, the building department notes that uh, sign permits and building permits are required. Uh, engineering notes that encroachment permit and new patio permits are required. The environment uh, team uh, cautions that uh, designated substances should be evaluated and, uh, and ensured for the safety of workers. The licensing uh, department notes that uh, a, license, a business license is required. We also circulated the Ontario Heritage Trust who have an interest in this building and, uh, and they provided a number of comments which are outlined in the agenda. Uh, some having to do with the color and the paint scheme which we are addressing separately. They are supportive of the, uh, the Guinness Gates and the signage uh, as well, and, and the rest of the alterations, I should note. In terms of the consultation with this committee, uh, we did receive concerns that had to do with the colors, um, which are being addressed separately. Uh, there were some comments regarding the, uh, the signage uh, and the lighting, which are addressed in the, in the agenda. And, um, That's all I have at this point, Mr. Chair, and we recommend support of this application uh, and the conditions as outlined. Thank you. So st still part five, this is the Market Square uh, HCD, which is a different document from the old Zidnam one, just to point that out. Um, we have, first of all, the two members, Don and uh, Jane, that made comments in Dash, and I, they, have they been uh, accurately recorded? Yes. So now members of the public have a chance to make comments. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So I'm supportive of the project as described. Uh, it improves the attractiveness, especially on the Clarence Street uh, side. So one question, is the Prince George Hotel name staying as part of the renovation plans? And again, I'm going to put in a suggestion, echoing what I said uh, a little while ago. As part of the renovations, can we get a heritage history information plaque um, to be associated with the building? Because it's over 200 years old, right? And I don't know a lot about the history of it. We learned some more today. So I think it's just a major asset. It's right down in the main tourist area. And uh, I think it would really be uh, a nice thing to do. So thank you. Thank you. And you got that. So the, any other comments from members of the public? This would be also where the applicant would make comments. Seeing none, we go to a mover and a seconder for the recommendation. Moved by Don, seconded by Mac. Any final comments from members of the committee? Mac. Just to confirm, when we did the restoration there, I guess about 40 years ago now, God, a long time, we replaced all the windows and doors along the Market Street side and on, and on the front, and we did make those entrances set back. They weren't set back the way they were, so bringing them back out and filling them in is probably appropriate. In fact, back then, they had all the windows and the, what we used to call shaky landing back then, they're all painted. And, they, uh, and the provincial government changed the legislation. They could actually have windows that looked into bars because it was considered not to be a horrible thing anymore. And the year that we did it, we had to get a special letter from the provincial government to allow us to open those windows up because it, because it was new legislation. So it was, before then, it was a foul thing to be drinking, I guess. <laughs> I, I could make a comment about the public perception of someone going to uh, that location during a council meeting, but I won't. Um, any other final comments? Yes, Catherine. Um, just a quick comment about the ground floor as opposed to the upper two floors. Um, looking historically, those windows and doors have always been the same the upper floors and the ground floor. And uh, now we, we have a situation where um, we have a really um, 
significant difference between the ground floor level and the upper stories, one being very light and the other being very dark. And uh, I think that that's unfortunate. Hmm? Yeah. yeah. Clerk has taken note of that comment. Any others? That's done. I uh, just want to follow up um, comment about the signage. I mean, I don't think I'm not really too concerned about that. But I, in, in my dash comment, I mentioned I was disappointed in the Darcy's logo as being a very stark commercial kind of font and choice of colors. And uh, staff responded, you know, basically. It's okay, but I hope the applicants will look at uh, alternative uh, signage for the word Darcy's. Because there, there are other Darcy's in other countries that have different signage, so it's not a case of one size fits everything. Yeah, that, okay. So it looks like it's time to vote on the recommendation, which, as it's a part five, is that Heritage Kingston Sports Council's approval of the following. It's got a description of the work in three points and 11 conditions, including approval from the Ontario Heritage Trust, which is condition number 10. So uh, we'll call the question on the recommendation. All those in favor? Opposed, and that carries. Good luck. Now we're at 81 Gore Street. Again, this is uh, part five, back to the old Sydenham HCD. It's currently 11.30. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 81 Gore Street uh, is in the Sydenham District, Part 5. Uh, it's located between Wellington and King Street East on the north side of Gore Street. Uh, the subject property is a, is a brick building uh, built before 1892, perhaps as old as, as, uh, as 1840s. Uh, designated in 2005, it's a significant uh, building in the district. Uh, and these are some of the attributes. The applicants wish to add black shutters to the front of the building. Uh, they are wood uh, on the upper three windows. They're designed to, are proposed to design to fit the windows themselves uh, and uh, are in a louvered pattern. And I did include just a picture of one from Johnson Street, which is very similar to what uh, the applicants are proposing. In terms of our review, um, there is evidence that shutters existed on this building at one time. There are remnants of brackets and, uh, and some minor staining on the building. Uh, the proposed, um, and they are going to be sized to fit the window in wood, which is in, in compliance with the district plan. Uh, the proposed use of black, uh, uh, applicants have been suggesting, or staff have been suggesting that the applicants reconsider black. Uh, however, the HCD plan, HCD plan does not uh, specifically include policies to restrict uh, the use of black. Um, and of course, painting wood is a reversible uh, intervention uh, and therefore could be altered in the future as, uh, as tastes and trends change. Uh, the use of black as an accent color in the district has become more increasingly more prevalent. Uh, and while staff continue to request uh, reconsideration of the color, uh, we do support the use of color. And uh, this was uh, similar to the comments we received from members of this committee, and we did provide them to, uh, to the applicant. And um, the applicant is, is, uh, would like to proceed with her uh, plans for black. So in terms, so we are supportive of this application, uh, subject to the conditions. Uh, we did circulate, of course, uh, our forestry team just wants to flag that the tree out front is a city-owned tree and uh, to avoid compaction to its root by uh, uh, any materials that need to be stored there during, during construction. Kingston Hydro wants to flag that there needs to be a minimum clearance from the hydro lines. 
uh, and uh, and I noted the comments provided by this committee, and we are supportive of this application, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Don and Jane, were your comments in Dash? Correct. Yes, they were. So members of the public have a chance to add comments? Seeing none, need a mover and a seconder? Moved by Councillor Shell, seconded by Catherine. So the recommendation is as usual in an HCD that we would support Council's approval. The work is the installation of the shutters as described and there would be four conditions. Um, does anyone want to add any final comments? Mac. When I look at the elevation of the, uh, of the building, um, it would have been helpful to actually see the drawings, to see a drawing that actually showed the shutters on it. It seems to me that the, uh, can you turn back to that, to that shot of the front elevation? Uh, right there. The shutter on the, on the upper left-hand side you know, they claim they're going to be operating so they'll fit, so that one on the left is going to be half the width of the window, obviously, and it seems to me that it's going to be really close to the corner of the building, and I'm just, just think that might look a little bit odd. I would have liked to have preferred to have seen a drawing that showed the shutters on there, you know, show how much space there is between them and uh, would give us a better feel, but it just, like, it just seems like an odd thing to have a shutter that's going to be right to the corner of the building, um, which I think it must be in order to be able to fit. Um, so I'm, I would have preferred to have, you know, it's a, I know it's a District 5, right? Or at, at Part 5. I would prefer to have seen a drawing that actually showed that so we could have a better feel as to what it was going to look like. Yes, and just, just as a further comment, when you're looking at the picture, the space between the first and second windows from the left, so the one that Mac was just talking about, the next window over, if both shutters are open, they would be almost touching between those two windows for the same reason. Like, I really wonder if the owners have really had a look at that themselves. They're really, you know, shutters is a good idea, a nice idea, but if they've, I wonder if they've actually drawn that up to see what it might look like, because they might not want to do it. You know, it might look a little strange, but there's going to be basically solid shutters in that section, so, you know. I would suggest that they, before they go ahead, they do a sketch of it to see whether it's what they really want. So the clerk has added that to your comments. Catherine, you're next. Um, I agree with Mac on that. Um, on a couple of other points. Um, just to have them on the top and not have them on the ground floor seems to me to... Um, it will really alter the visual balance of the building um, when you're looking at it. You know, I just recommend that they consider if they are going to go through with putting them on the top, that they would install uh, shutters on the ground floor too. And um, a final point is, and I should have made this before in relation to William Street. Um, what I have seen in Kingston is people putting shutters on buildings, traditional shutters, or they've taken them off to paint them, and they've put them on upside down. And so, and that's the case on Cartwright House, which is a real shame. So to make sure that actually the shutters, which is supposed to look operational, even though they might not be operated, um, are actually the right way up. I apologize, I was talking to the clerk. The, did you get that last comment? Okay, he's a good multitasker. Thank you, Jane. Er, it's, uh, thank you, Catherine. Um, right, does anyone else wish to add any comments? Don. Well, just a brief comment about the color black. Um, I, you know, uh, uh, it's not a big deal, but um, I think it's, you know, let me clarify that the district plan does say the choices of colors are important and they should be appropriate to the period of the of the heritage uh, property and um, i think black was probably not uh, a common color in the 19th century i'm you know i, I there may there may be other evidence but uh, it's true that the plan doesn't say Black is not allowed. It also doesn't say purple or neon is not allowed. It says you should choose colors 
appropriate to the period and style of the buildings. Turk has captured that comment. Thank you. It's all similar to the comment that was made in Dash. Jane? Okay, I would like to add a comment. Uh, I guess you need to take the chair. All right, you have the floor. Thank you, this is my comment. The example given from 90 Johnson Street, I think it was, and the, with a photo, which is actually to the point of what it might look like. If we get an example from another building, if we could just get that up for a minute. So that's on a limestone building, which is very light gray with the black, and also the black, you see the black detailing on the, uh, the feature underneath the window there, right? That probably works in that setting, even though it's black and even though it's probably not very heritage uh, authentic. Just the basic color scheme of light gray and black is, is not jarring. The red brick and black is a completely different mixture. So this example, even though those might be the shutters that are in vision, it, it because of the color difference of the red brick versus the gray lime, light gray limestone, I think there's a, quite a big difference. And again, to Mac's point about having a uh, a rendering with the with the proposed with the black shutters with the width that they actually would be on the second story only, all of this put together, it's not so much that. We don't want to recommend that you put shutters in here or that you improve your building and the intent is good. It's the, the um, helpful suggestion that your design, although your intention may be good, your design may not be actually the best that it could be for, uh, for the intention that you have. So uh, we're kind of in a, a strange, place for recommending this to council because we want you to make an improvement to your building but we don't want you to make a mistake that you'll later regret. So I'm not sure if I should recommend this to council or not <laughs> because I think because I think it I, I think there's probably a better design possible that the applicants would be okay with so that, that's my comment. I return the chair. Michelle, I saw your hand. Oh, yeah. Just a comment, it is shutters. It's not gonna alter the building. And if they hate them, they can take them down. <laughs> but it's not a, a, an alteration to the building itself that, that we may object to. Thanks. Good point. Mac wants to add another comment. Are the owners here? No, okay. Yeah, unfortunately, they're not able to hear, hear these comments. I, I presume that the staff will pass on our concerns. I just think they're going to look really top heavy and solid wood, and I just don't think it's a good idea. So anyway, uh, the, the final question is a yes or no. Do we recommend this to council? Council also has to decide yes or no, and uh, they're probably going, they're going to read our comments. So that's this is what we're doing. We're giving council um, uh, more information for them to, to help them make a decision. Yes, Don, you want to add a comment? Just a comment that uh, if we and council approve it, uh, the applicant is not required to go ahead and do it. They can still think about it and make their choice. And uh, is it correct, staff, that if the, they reconsider their choice of color to a, to a different color that might match the red brick better, that that would be fine with the current recommendation? Doesn't seem to be anything about color in the recommendation. Uh, Mr. Chair, there's nothing specific in the uh, outline on, on color that I can see, um, but it is part of their application, so we've encouraged them to, to consider a different color, and we'd have to cross that bridge when, uh, when we get there, I suppose. And keep in mind that everything we say on a Part 5 application is helpful suggestions any, to begin with, right? So you just have to decide what, whether you're comfortable recommending this to council or not, and then we're going to vote. I'll give you about 10 seconds to think about it, and then I'm going to call the vote.
Okay, so here we go. All those in favor? All those opposed? And the recommendation fails. Next up is 95 King Street East. And it, this is the last permit application. The, there is another item after this, which is a pre-consultation for the Crown Knight Club Inn. And then the approval of a heritage easement agreement Sorry, not an approval, an information report about a heritage easement agreement and then the working group reports, just so that you know with the time that we have left. Go ahead, Ryan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So again, this is a landmark property in the uh, Old Sydenham Heritage District on the corner of King Street East and West. Uh, it is the, uh, the Queen Anne building uh, known as the Henry House. Uh, it is built in 1886, designated under both parts four and five. Uh, the, this is the property here. I'm sure you all know it. Um, what is before us today is an application to address this uh, greenhouse on the rear of the property. Uh, it is visible from, uh, from West Street. So the property, as I noted, is, is noted as significant in the district. Uh, it has association with uh, Power, uh, Joseph Power, the architect. Um, and it is, uh, has, includes attributes of the district itself. I would note that the greenhouse, as before you, is not part of the, uh, the heritage attributes of this, of this property. So the applicants are proposing to retain the uh, foundation uh, knee walls of this building, the, the bottom part of the building, remove the greenhouse uh, glass structure at the top and replace it with uh, the hip-roofed wooden and glass structure that, is, that you see before you. Uh, the applicants are proposing to use uh, sash windows uh, in a, framed in an off-white color to match the building. Uh, the roof is to be a, a metal roof, uh, either in a standing seam or a tile profile to match the, the house itself. Uh, there's a small um, hood for the, the door on, on West Street to cover the door or to go over the door. Uh, and there's also a breezeway to connect to a, a later rear addition on this building um, just to the left. So in terms of our review, the, uh, the addition uh, is located on the rear of the property. It's clearly uh, subordinate to the prominence of this uh, grandiose building, uh, landmark building. It complements the building in its design uh, and will be painted and, and designed to match some of the features and pay tribute to the features of the building. Uh, and will have a positive impact uh, on the character of the building and the district. Uh, so we support this application. The, uh, the agencies noted that the forestry noted that uh, the preservation of the existing tree cover is strongly recommended in this area. Um, Hydro Kingston uh, flagged that their minimum clearance uh, is required for many power lines. And then in terms of the committee's comments, uh, we did receive comments noting the glazing pattern was inconsistent with the, uh, the rest of the house. Uh, and staff do uh, concur with those comments and have had a conversation with the applicants who've agreed to, uh, to alter their, their glazing pattern to a two over two or, or one over one pattern to match the rest of the house. So, so that has been built in as a condition of approval, uh, which are outlined before you and we recommend approval. Thanks. Thank you, Ryan. So the members have had a chance to put their uh, Comments in Dash. I'm just trying to find exactly where, page 350. Yeah, so Don and Jane, they were included. Okay, so now we go to members of the public. Seeing none, again, if the applicant wants to speak, this is the chance. Seeing none, we will go to uh, the recommendation. Need a mover and a seconder. Moved by Councillor Shell, seconded by Jane. So you see the description of the alteration, and then there are six conditions attached. You've heard the description. So we, this is your chance for final comments. Yes, Mac. 
If I'm not mistaken, that greenhouse was approved back in the uh, late 80s, I believe it was. I think it was just before I came on to Heritage for the first time, way back then. And I remember it got approved and then the, the, the everybody's horrified by the brick. Um, I know they're talking about reusing the existing foundation and uh, I just wonder how much more work it'd be to take that brick down and put something as appropriate. It's always been a, a total eyesore from my perspective. Um, pardon me? He did? I could be wrong. Okay, any other final comments? Councilor Shell? It is so rare to have an artist rendering and it's wonderful. I mean, they look so humane and warm and actually, in a way, really emphasize that the windows were a little over the top compared to the rest of the house. But uh, what beautiful drawings. It was great to see. Thank you. Okay, Clark has taken note of that. Any other final comments? All right, so we need to vote on the recommendation that Heritage Kingston supports Council's approval of the application. All those in favor? All those opposed? That carries unanimously. Good luck. That's the end of the permits. So now we have a pre-consultation, Front Lac Club Inn, and uh, an information report and the working group reports. Um, because we have to, we don't, vote on the pre-consultation application or the heritage uh, easement, maybe we should vote on receiving the working group reports right now before we lose, in case we might lose quorum later. The rest of the items are non-binding, uh, non-voting items. So uh, that's what I'm going to do. I need to uh, consent of the committee to move working group reports forward to uh, this point in the agenda. Um, if you're in favor, raise your hand. All those in favor? Opposed? Okay, so working group reports. The Cultural Heritage Working Group report is page 418, which, uh, and if anyone has any questions or comments, now would be the time. So this is a um, popular group, and ha uh, the, you'll see the uh, eight members were present in this particular meeting in August. There you see the report, and some of the stuff was re related to what we heard earlier from cultural staff. Are there any... You guys are setting up for the pre-consultation, I take it? Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> Professor Ca or Dr. Campbell's here. Uh, does anyone have any questions about the working group? I just have a comment that we probably haven't seen or it hasn't caught the attention of whatever parties might be the voices that, uh, that we're hearing in social media and across the country about the conversation about Sir John A. Macdonald's legacy, that there's probably more to come on that. And because this is an ongoing project uh, under the cultural heritage section, the working group will be uh, will, will be further discussing this, and um, I just wanted to wish them luck at dealing with that sensitive subject. Any other, anyone else wish to ask questions or make comments? Okay, so we need a vote to uh, uh, receive the cultural heritage working group. Um, what is it called? Uh, meeting notes. Uh, I need a mover and a seconder. Councilor Shell. Don, all those in favor, opposed, and that carries. And then the other one is the Heritage Assets work, Working Group. Just next in the agenda, there is, sorry, there was, there was actually two uh, cultural heritage uh, notes, August and September. And then uh, now we've got the Heritage Asset Working Group notes from June. Is that, there's, was there not another meeting since then? No? Yeah, okay, so it, perhaps uh, those notes will be on the next agenda. Uh, anyway, today there's just the Heritage Asset Working Group notes for 5th of June. Do you have to clarify something? 
I just wanted to say the Heritage Assets Working Group only meets when we have items for consideration or, or work to be done. So that's, we also hold the notes to go with the report that they generate. So that's why you've seen a delay in these notes coming forward. Okay, so anyway, you see this uh, report here with the various artifacts. Uh, any comments, questions? Okay, so we'll vote to receive this. I need a mover and a seconder. Uh, Don and Jane, all those in favor? Opposed, and that carries. So now we're back to item 10, the heritage pre-consultation for the Front Art Club Inn. All right, so last but not least, we have a pre-consultation for 225 uh, King Street East, which is the Frontenac Club. Uh, the property is designated under parts four and five of the Ontario Heritage Act. Um, the applicants have requested this pre-consultation meeting uh, with the committee prior to advancing a full permit uh, at the October meeting. Um, so today we have uh, Ray Zabak of uh, Zabak and Schultz with us to present. We also, I also see Andre Scheinman, who is uh, working as a heritage consultant for the group, and as well as the two owners are here. So we've got a full team um, to answer questions. All right, Ray, I can welcome you up. Before you start, Mr. Zabak, we are going to start losing committee members in about 10 minutes. Just please don't be offended if people start leaving the room and they've told us their commitment in advance. Okay. So first I'm going to show you a kind of a video of the building. I don't have any pictures of the existing building uh, to compare these two, but I think you all know it pretty well. And some of you have already taken a tour of the property. So I'm just going to get right to this. I understand I have about 10 minutes right now, so I'll try and be brief. Um, so here's a little video run through. Um, as you know, the building on the corner is the uh, Cartwright residence built in 1820, I believe around 1820. And uh, that's 20 William Street. The uh, building on the right there, of course, is the uh, beautiful Frontenac Club that was built as the first bank of Montreal in uh, Upper Canada, I guess. Um, uh, that is a, uh, you know, it's an iconic building, I would say, in the city of Kingston. So we understand the importance of this project. Uh, I'm just going to take a little run around here, a little flyby. Um, hang on a second here. Can I expand that out? Yeah, sorry, there we go. Yeah. So the, um, I just let this run through. Uh, this is the King Street elevation. This is the south elevation we're looking at now. King Street is to the west. South elevation of the building as we would like to see it. Uh, you're going to notice some appendages to this, this glass addition on the roof. Swinging around to the east now, the Cartwright House. There will be some window replacements in this project. I'll go into some detail about that. Uh, and this is swinging around to the north. So this is the William Street Elevation, Cartwright House on the left, Frontenac Club on the right, and a number of what the um, historic uh, volume calls random additions that join the, the two buildings. Frontenac Club was 1845. Uh, here's another one of these glass additions on the top of the building. There are two of those. And this sort of swings up to a top view of the building. In uh, aerial view from William Street. And around to the front. Now I can run through that again, but uh, I have some other, I have some building elevations, some uh, still shots of this thing uh, that we can look at as well. But the, the main thrust of this renovation, the building will remain a hotel but the intention of the project is to upgrade the hotel, to modernize the rooms, to make the rooms more contemporary. Uh, inside the building, there's a big, uh, the beautiful stair, which used to take the banker, the, uh, the manager of the bank, up to his residence, and that is staying. Uh, but we are modernizing the rooms. We're putting on a couple of strategic additions to uh, create some really spectacular rooms, what we think are really quite spectacular rooms within the building. Um, we're also doing some interior renovations that improve the fire exiting from the building. Right now, there's a bit of a circuitous uh, 
uh, the fire department's approved it all over the years, but it's a bit, uh, the, uh, we think there's some deficiencies in the fire exiting. And we, we will now be able to join both buildings, the Cartwright House and the Frontenac Club, with an in interior connection. Right now, if you, if you stay in the front and the Cartwright building, you have to check in in the main building, go back outside and go into the Cartwright building. So we have some strategic renovations inside the building that will join the whole thing to, uh, together. Um, the, um, uh, so what you saw in the, um, in the presentation here, and I'm just gonna get out of this, uh, Alex, uh, I gotta escape. Excuse me a second. Okay, so here we are. Um, what you are uh, looking at here is, that's the, um, of course, the main elevation on King and William Street. Um, significant items you see on this, I think the owners would like to put a, a, a marquee, a small marquee over the William Street entrance door. That would be independent of the building, supported off the two knee walls, uh, the balustrades of the stair. Uh, that would just be sort of a fabric awning there, minor thing. Um, what we would like to do with the door in that, at that uh, location is we'd like to substitute the door, the double doors that are there now. There's some ornate wood doors. We'd like to move those to the front of the building. The front of the building is not the original door. It's been a recent improvement. Um, with the layout of the building, that front door will, will, will not be operational anymore. So we want to move those double doors to the front door. They, they fit. They basically fit within a few inches. We will take them, move them to the front, and we will put a more contemporary door on the William Street entrance with, in conjunction with that canopy. Um, this is going down King Street to the west or to the south. Um, most, I should mention, most of the windows of the building, there is a window report that was included with this application. We're retaining most of the windows, I think pretty well all of the windows on the original Frontenac Club and on the Cartwright House. There are some window replacements in some of the power and sun uh, connections between the two buildings. I'm not gonna go into those in any detail, but you would have that in front of you there. Um, sorry, back to that one. We're, um, there is a shingled addition on the, uh, if you can see that there. That addition was put on by the Bosper family probably sometime in the 40s or the 50s. Uh, we're leaving that there, but we're replacing some windows, some fenestration in that up top, and recladding that building in uh, fiber cement board, horizontal fiber cement board. Um, we're also tidying up some kind of cluttered uh, renovations that were done at that time to that area. Um, The major, as I mentioned, I think the major interventions that we're talking about here are these glass additions on the, um, what in uh, that, if you know the building, there was a bowling alley that was built when it became the men's club. That addition is being constructed, the addition here. Oh, my cursor's gone. Um, anyway, you can see it there. On top, that is on top of the bowling alley. We're actually, uh, adding a portion of the building there. We're gonna use some local Kingston limestone for the limestone uh, portion of that next to the fire escape. And we'll be using a capless curtain wall on the uh, end of that room. Uh, that will provide the sort of living room end of the suite, which is being extended in that location. You'll also notice the fire escapes here. Uh, I mentioned earlier, the building has this kind of uh, odd sort of um, jury rigged arrangement of fire escapes, which gets you out of the top floor of the building. We're actually going to uh, do some roof work to the building, which will give us actual flat platforms. And you can walk out off the top floor of the building, cross the roof, down, back, and off the end of the building. We are replacing what is an, an illegal spiral fire escape, which is in the, uh, the uh, southeast corner, where that uh, full down fire escape is now.
The other glass addition is on a portion of the building which was added, we think, by the Vosper family sometime in the 1940s. Uh, this is the area um, portion here that uh, my cursor seems to vanish here again. Oh, there we go. I'm not sure what's happening there. Anyway. Uh, that where the blue rectangle is there, what that is. Can't find it here. James, oh, there we go. Okay, I got it. I just got the tab. There you go. Okay. So that area, uh, that is another glass addition. It's actually a two-story glass addition at that point. That extends the two rooms that are now enclosed in that kitchen wing addition on the original building. It expands those rooms, gives them a bigger window in the living room area of those rooms. It gives them a beautiful view back to the city and the lake. Really makes those rooms quite spectacular. Uh, we're using a capless curtain wall system, and I have some examples of that for our discussion perhaps later. Uh, some local examples of where that's been done and some international examples where that's been done on large scale and smaller scale buildings. Um, we are uh, um, other interventions we're doing. I mentioned windows. We're keeping most of the windows on the original two buildings. And a lot of the windows on that kitchen addition in behind the original building, but on the Drever addition on the opposite side of the building. Uh, the windows you see to the right there, that's the uh, billiard room and the bowling alley addition on the right hand side there. There are some windows in there that were uh, probably installed with the building around 1912 that we're replacing. They're not in great condition. We're, but we are replacing them in the same kind of mullion pattern, same, same fenestration pattern that they have now. The other thing we're doing with those, uh, I think when Bear Weatherup had the, uh, bought the building, he lowered some of the sills on some of these windows to create walkouts into the backyard. We're actually reversing that. We're going to build those back up, reinstall the sills in the original locations where they're intended by Power and Son in 1912. Um, in terms of um, ex other exterior works, we're putting on a new standing seam roof on the uh, existing, on the main building. Uh, we are going to, we have a proposal that I have in my slides here that shows you how we're going to do that. We're actually going to leave the bat and seam room in place that's there now, augment it with a new roofing system on top of it, and we will be able to put new downspouts in the building where we won't have to use the stone gutter any longer but we will use the locations of the existing downspouts to bring the water down to the ground. There are, there are holes cut in that stone cornice that allow us to do that. We're gonna take advantage of those and reuse those. Uh, the interior, uh, I mentioned retaining the main stair in the building. Uh, we're retaining the vault in the building as part of the restaurant experience, uh, creating a new restaurant and bar within the building. And then, uh, Part of the site work on the building you see on the left hand side there is developing the landscaping extensively on the site to create an outdoor patio that's an extension of that restaurant and I think we're trying to get approval for an actual outdoor uh, fireplace um, that's going to be subject to uh, some other discussions with the building department as well but um, that is the intention to have a seating area out there for the restaurant and bar an outdoor seating area and an outdoor amenity space improving the parking lot. Right now the parking lot is basically a gravel lot, not very well landscaped, and the intention here is to, to, uh, uh, to really fix that up. Um, most, I think all of the trees on the property are remaining, um, and I mentioned the entrance from, um, the, the actual entrance, you will be able to enter the property from the existing gate that is on the, um, that interrupts the stone fence along King Street. So overall, I, I think the main components of this, the main things that um, I know we discussed with the committee before were the, those two glass extensions on the building. Uh, the hot points, as I recall, were those. Uh, I think there was general support for those, but I'll let you speak for yourself. Um, the, um, the intervention at the door on William Street with the canopy and the new door in that location. Um, 
And there were some comments about some of the windows in the building. And I think we, you have a full report from Andre about the, uh, the intention we have of the window replacements there. You can answer any questions about that. Thank you. So this is a relatively informal uh, consultation, right? You, so we can have a back and forth. We can also uh, try to keep it fairly brief, though, because we're going to lose quorum soon. Um, this is uh, an attempt to get some of our input into the process in an early stage, right? So that the final application will be, you know, as good as it can be. So who would like to uh, go first, Mac? Um, the, uh, um, I really like the, the two glass additions. Um, it, it, they just look a little commercial to me. I mean, could we it, it, just, you know, I know it's early stages. Could they be warmed up with a little with some wooden pilasters and so forth, or have you gotten into that detail of it? Uh, the curtain wall windows? Yes, the curtain walls. Could you just elaborate on that, Mac? What do you say? So, oh, that's okay. Well, they, they, there's the, 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 uh, I, um, I like the curtain walls, but they look a little commercial to me. I'm just wondering if they couldn't be warmed up with some columns in the corners and maybe a little bit of more wood fenestration and, uh, added to them. I'm just, you know, I'm not really sold one way or the other, but just the thought. Uh, those are the, um, we're talking about the glass. The glass yes, the, 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 the two glass additions. The, um, well, we we sort of like the austerity of those. We, we, um, we like the, you know, we try to make them as transparent. They're clear glass. So they're, um, our, I think our idea is we'll be able to look through those and see some of the original building materials within the building in mm -hmm. behind them. But we, we'd like to limit the number of the materials on the exterior building to a, to a minimum. One other question. You said you had a, a de do you have a de that detail with you and how you're planning doing the, Roof over top of the roof to I do. fix up the gutter details. Have to find it here. Here we go. That's it. There. That's just a hand sketch. But uh, the yellow line is the is the uh, profile of the existing roof. So our idea would be to put strapping in between the battens that are on the roof, and to uh, put another uh, roof sheathing on top of that with, and then build up with more um, wood framing on top of that. Uh, insulating in that, we have to just look at the kind of science of all this because we, we're, you know, we have to be concerned about things like condensation. But the idea is to put in, uh, to actually put an external gutter on the building at that point. And, and the illustrations you have that I'm showing you actually actually show that if you look at them close. But actually putting a gutter on the building and using the holes, those board holes that are in the cornice, to take those rainwater leaders down at the same location they were originally. And, and that'll also allow you to sort of hide that eave a bit, won't it? Because yes. you, you, what you see is a nice stone, right. um, stone cornice work and so forth. That's nice. Right. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. We think it's going to work, but we'll <laughs> have to. That's the intention. Yes. yes. I have a question. Just, uh, I, I guess I should give up the chair for this because even though we're in pre-consultation. So anyway, just as a Cinnamon District Councillor, I think some of my uh, nearby residents would be interested in uh, the plans, sort of change of use of, of uh, compared to what the Front Night Club in is currently. Is the, is the intention to basically be a higher scale uh, type of accommodation than it is what is there currently? Well, I could let the owners talk to that, but I, I believe I know what the intention is. It's, I think the, um, it is to make it more of a sort of a modern, more uh, boutique hotel there. Um, offer a little more in terms of the, you know, obviously the bar and the restaurant, the food facilities. Um, but it is to make the, make the, um, the rooms are being extensively remodeled in the corridors. They're, they're being modernized. We're going to have very sort of contemporary glass, uh, you know, washrooms are going to, or bathrooms are going to be, uh, extensively upgraded, modified. Don, Sean likes talking about it. Yeah, hi, just just to introduce yourself and maybe you could give us a little bit more detail about this sure. the sort of vision of this for the residents of Sydenham. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, Council, thank you. Uh, 
appreciate the opportunity. Our, our intention is to introduce a product into the Kingston marketplace that doesn't currently exist. So to provide uh, a boutique hotel that would be very similar to what you would experience uh, in places like Maine uh, and Rhode Island or in some of the larger cities like New York or Santa Monica or so on is to, to provide that level of, of product. My name is Sean Billing. Uh, I worked with uh, several large hotel companies around the world and I'm delighted to be back uh, in, in Kingston working uh, in partnership with my partners. Um, so we have the opportunity, we believe. I don't believe anybody should have a historic bathroom experience. So when Ray speaks to us um, updating the interiors, really what we're talking about is, is maintaining the character of the individual rooms as they are today, but adding to them some modern comforts and amenities, in particular uh, with bathrooms. Uh, when Ray speaks to the lounge um, aspect, uh, it's really not a restaurant that we're introducing. Um, it's much more of a, of a lounge and social space for our neighborhood. Um, we see the opportunity in Kingston. There's a great many places, great many pubs, uh, wonderful ones, a great many restaurants, uh, but a place to go and, um, and be social with friends and neighbors uh, doesn't, doesn't exist in our, in our immediate neighborhood, uh, and that's what we'd like to introduce. So in addition to servicing the guests that we will have and that we do have today, in the manner that we do by offering them, you know, conveniences like breakfast on site and things like that, we'll introduce a, a cocktail hour after 2 o'clock. So we're very, very excited about uh, being able, you know, as the fifth owners of the building, we, we feel a real stewardship uh, to that building. We're really excited about the opportunity to not only uh, restore it, but also to provide uh, a little bit of an upgrade. So uh, my thanks for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Thank you. I would just like to say that uh, I observed uh, two blocks away a, a redesign of a, of a restaurant space and uh, that is currently very very um, successful it's called the rustic spot it's two blocks up it is it, it's a pub atmosphere but with uh, gourmet food and it's it 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 is so popular that that you need reservations even during the week so that last uh, element that you mentioned which is different from the current use would probably you'll be surprised what the neighbor how the neighborhood might might uh, support that kind of thing. I, th I think there's a lot of untapped uh, capacity in that regard for the neighborhood, as you say, because there isn't very much in the neighborhood that is not residential units. So, um, so I think the vision is is actually pretty uh, compatible with what uh, the residents uh, may uh, support. I'm hopeful anyway if it's well executed. Thank you. Yes, Don, you're next. Uh, a question about moving the uh, William Street door to the King Street doorway. Um, the King Street door is not new, but it, it uh, currently has side lights. Are the side lights original, or are, would they have to be removed to move the William Street um, door? We don't know what the original door of that building looked like. Or maybe Andre can comment on that. Yeah, just grab a microphone there, Andre. Um, yeah, so the, uh, the front door, uh, as it was pictured by um, the students at University of Toronto in 1961, uh, the William Street door uh, is uh, as it was then. Uh, the King Street door looked, was the same uh, uh, treatment as the William Street door is now. Um, the, but a wider version. So the side lights date from whenever this, the treatment that's there now on King Street was put in. Uh, so likely, uh, likely if the, um, the, so the, the, the version of the door that's on William Street is narrower and so then what the, the King Street version was. But it's exactly the same motif. Uh, exactly the same treatment in terms of panels and lights, etc. So um, it's likely that if the King, if the William Street door was moved, uh, the, the uh, some version of a side light would probably still be needed. Go ahead, Jane. I was interested in your sort of precedent examples uh, for the glass, those two glass rooms, and I still have some difficulty 
sort of reconciling that with the uh, Old Sydenham uh, Conservation District, just in that the precedents you seem to have aren't within a historic conservation district. So I'm, I'm still having difficulty with that, and I kind of tend to agree with Mac that I'd rather see something less stark um, and commercial looking, I guess. Uh, and I'm sure you can achieve what you want by reconsidering that, so. And, and I have seen that kind of glass wall or whatever on, on older buildings, but not necessarily in a, I just don't, I'm concerned about the appropriateness of them in, within the heritage district, so that's one thing. I'm really, really happy about the window plan. That looks great, um, that it's so much restoration's being done and, and also that the windows are kind of being rationalized now. Um, the other thing is I'm r really pleased that lighting is being addressed because it is in a residential neighborhood. So, you know, some dark sky friendly lighting would be way nicer for the people who live around there. And also that there was a comment from staff or looking into noise because I think that's also an issue in, in the neighborhood. Um, or, or could could become an issue, I guess, let's put it that way. The other thing that looks great is a lot of the, um, uh, the environmentally friendly stuff you're doing for the landscaping. So I guess my big concern right now is the, the, the two glass blocks in the Heritage Conservation District. Yeah. Well, again, um, if I could just talk to that again, I mean, we... Um, I would be a bit more concerned myself if perhaps those were right out on the main streets of the building. I, I mean, I think what we see this building doing is kind of falling in line with what's happened to this building over the years. Uh, there were two buildings there joined with a bunch of what the uh, historical uh, uh, volume calls uh, random additions. And there were different styles that were added in here. There's a kind of a jumble of additions in between the existing, in those two significant buildings. And this is a 2018 version of one of those. And I think, uh, the, I think the, the word that comes to mind is it's benign. It's, uh, it's a beautiful box on the building. You will see the original materials that preceded it or that were there before it went on, you will see those. The intention is to be able to see those through the windows. It's clear glass, it's not reflective. There will be some reflectivity, you know, just uh, even in clear glass in certain, from certain angles. But the idea is to have that sort of visual penetration through it. There will be warmer materials within the rooms, which will be evident from the exterior. But we, we're trying to limit the number of materials that go on the building. I think just think that makes a much more powerful statement. Yeah, so the simpler those things are, in my opinion, the better. Yeah, when I first saw you uh, put the rendering up, that was the very first thing that jumped out. I think that any heritage uh, advocate would would instantly look at that. But I think uh, it's it's a challenge to be overcome. Uh, it's a challenge to integrate it as best you can. I would I would recommend that you take a close look at the district plan uh, for Sydenham and of exactly what it says about uh, new additions and compatibility with the heritage fabric. You've got Andre Scheinman uh, at your disposal as well. So uh, I, I think I, I don't I wouldn't rule it out as a possibility, but I think it has absolutely has to be well executed and. Uh, and it will kind of will make or break the design uh, is, is, is how it's treated. And it's, it's not possible to tell from the computer rendering, unfortunately, at this point. I would just say proceed with extreme caution. Don. Uh, just uh, my comment on the glass rooms. The, the one at the sort of the uh, rearmost one is is less visible from either street, and uh, I think uh, I think that might be acceptable. The one that's quite visible from William Street again, I think it's pushing the boundaries of the of the district plan. Um, if that's a a two-story 
space, then I, I'd be happier if it read as two stories with a, uh, a kind of uh, a solid bit separating the, the two parts of it. I, I think there'd be less, uh, less of an impact uh, on, on William Street. Yeah. Well, okay, the, just... the primary function of, of this consultation is actually for us to inform the, the designers of our recommendations, helpful suggestions, essentially, right? So do you go ahead, Jane. Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, I guess I'd be a little more amenable to the whole glass thing if it was, I think it's already been stepped back a bit on the William Street side from the original. Is that correct? Yeah. And when I look at it from that, the one that's on the back, when you see that from, if you lived across the street on King Street, you would see a good chunk of it. If that were stepped back to the, the wall that shields it um, at, with a little space or a balcony or something, I think it might soften the look too. So that's just another suggestion or comment. Yeah, that's it. I mean, part of the part of the plan was to actually make it visible from you know up. It, it is a minor component of that building from from King Street, but it's um, you know it's a sort of we think it's sort of a uh, uh, again a, a sort of uh, neutral, benign kind of appendage to this thing, and it. Uh, uh, it just, in, in my opinion, there's absolutely no confusion about what is existing and what is, what is new in this building. Um, See, Mr. Scheinman has something to add here. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, just to speak to that view, I mean, you know, if you look at it and, you know, you have to sort of believe that that perspective view has, is somewhat true, um, you know, it really doesn't read much more than a conservatory would. Uh, that, that rear addition. I mean, a glass conservatory would look just the same, a little solarium or conservatory. Uh, you know, you're not looking at a kind of massive expanse of glass, uh, you know, and, and it's not, it's not, uh, it, you know, it's just, it's just a, 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 a very small component of that whole elevation uh, as you look at it. So, I, you know, I, it, it's hard to see it as, a, you know, that that is objectionable. Obviously, the one on uh, uh, facing William and closer to the front, you know, has has much more presence, and and that is a you know, and that is, uh, you know, a uh, uh, I, mean, I think can generate more more comment uh, based on that. But uh, uh, the smaller one at the rear, I I, I find hard to to to, uh, to see as as uh, you know t too much of something. Um, the, I think I think what the you know the architects intended to do is to you know insert uh, something that's uh, that is contemporary um, that uh, doesn't you know is clearly contrasting to um, all the all, you know all the stonework I mean there's you know they're, they're, you know the polar opposites of of glass and stone um, and you know though though the one that we see here in this slide has you know, uh, has volume, um, it's still, um, it, you know, it, it still uh, allows the whole of the, the building, uh, the existing building with all its components uh, to be read quite clearly. Uh, in fact, anything uh, much more solid, although there might be a case for, for um, uh, you know, a adding some elements uh, that, that, that break up the glass a bit, but uh, but in any case, um, you know anything in you know, anything too much more solid starts to muddy those the the elements that are that are existing. You know, uh, so this way you you know you it's a it's a clear definition. Uh, the glass does provide that clear definition. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just saw Councillor Shell had a comment. Go ahead. Um, a quick one again about it's it's a lot the pictures um, the glass is dark the building is practically white but I thinking of uh, Brock and Wellington um, 
how different it looks from what we saw as computer drawings. Um, I, I just think a big part of the problem is it looks like a big heavy glass top instead of what you're imagining and that I can visualize too is a light glass top that you can see through and you'll see other parts of the building yeah. through. Um, because and, and it also makes it look huge and yet when you really look at it in comparison to the volume of the building around it, it doesn't seem to be that big. So I can certainly uh, live with it and see why you want to sort of integrate that to an old building that has no detail to it. It's yes. just breeds as glass. Um, so uh, your verbal description actually makes it more clear to me than this picture, which mm -hmm. is kind of crazy. The, <laughs> Backward for the thousand. If, if I could. Thanks. The best, the, the actual glass, if you want to see what we're proposing here, it's the, it's a larger scale, but the Scotiabank building on uh, uh, Princess and Wellington has this very glass system that we're proposing. And uh, just to clarify, that is, there are two stories within that. It's not just a two-story volume. There's actually a floor level where you see that little white band. That is probably going to be a bit deeper in there, and there, there will probably be a translucent panel in there. It will have a little more detail, perhaps, than this, but again, we, we would like to keep it, like Andre says, simple, clean, very distinct as the new portion of the building to the old. And, and, and I think with the reflectivity, general sort of common ref reflectivity you'll have on that during the day, I don't think it will look like a heavy mass on the building. I think it will look fairly light and, and uh, transparent. I don't, want to take, I don't want to take up any more air time about this, but I just don't want to see, like, people's luggage sitting there in the windows and, you know, like, how are you going to control that? Well, you can't. Yeah, so, I don't know, I still have, like, lots of reservations. I understand everything you're saying, but... And just for the record, uh, you mentioned the Scotiabank building. The historical fact is that that application failed at Heritage but passed at Council. So, uh, so you just, just be aware of the fact that it remained controversial even after it was built, oh, and, and I still get the odd comment about it. I did it? Oh, I didn't recall that. I... Part five, uh, there's a, that's a possibility, just so you know, uh, something could not uh, have the support of the majority of Heritage members at meeting here, but still get passed by council because it's council that makes a decision. And in the case of the Scotiabank building, that's what happened. So just so you know, uh, that's I, a one, uh, one possibility that could come out of this process. Could I, could I counter that argument? Uh, sorry, just bring something. It's not up. an argument; it's a historical fact. <laughs> well, okay, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. Okay, I'm not going to disagree. But that is a building at RMC, which is a similar concept, and that won a, a heritage award from the city of Kingston or from um, Interior. This is S and R. That you know, similar, different scale. And you mentioned it's not in an it's not in an urban context like we have. Uh, that's the Scotia Bank. That's the Queen's School of Medicine uh, edition that was passed by this committee. Um, that's the edition between 82 and 84 Barry Street. There's also the, um, the one that we have that isn't built yet at, on Queen's campus. Uh, the old gymnasium, I believe, has glass curtain wall. Yes. We have, just hasn't been built and, yet. And that building was, this is the Witchwood Library we're doing in Toronto. This building uh, received Heritage Committee approval of the City of Toronto. I know the unanimous approval there. So, you know, it, it's, um, I'm not sure what that one <laughs> received, but, uh, you know, this is, this is kind of what we were going for, this particular slide. And we see that addition, I mean, if you, if you, you be fair to that image, that old farmhouse is right there. There's nothing obscuring that. That addition is, in my words, completely benign. To it's a beautiful addition, and the uh, the existing building shows through. There's no uh, no confusion about what that is. Okay, great. Any other aspects people want to mention before we adjourn? Okay, so thank you very much for coming uh, today, Mr. Zabak, and the rest of you, and you. Mr. Skolnick. 
Oh, right, for the pre-consultation. Sorry, I'm, I'm skipping a step. Members of the public actually can interact as well. Are there any comments from members of the public? Please. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. So I'm exceptionally impressed with the ambitious scope of the project. Um, I've been to a number of events in the main part of the building. I've never stayed in the hotel part, but I think that you're really creative, really interesting. Um, something additional for Kingston that we don't already have, I think that's on the mark. So I'm friends with a member of the Cartwright family, and that building has a plaque on it that describes. So this is the third time today I've said this. I'll just get it off the top, uh, heritage description as part of the renovations um, for the Frontenac Club uh, section. Uh, second uh, sort of question or uh, point, um, I don't see any dormers being uh, installed or used on the top floor of the Frontenac building. So number one is, could solar panels be installed up there? There's no conflict with anything and or you have an attic possibility as well on the top floor of the, the front neck building. So that's an interesting scenario to look at. I'm wondering if you finalized the location of the bar restaurant yet. Um, you've got a lot of different uses going on in there. You're doing a lot with it. So, um, not going to be a big space, I don't think, but um, it's interesting that you're, you're doing that. I think it could be really po uh, popular. And this, I guess my last question is, um, you've got a King Street address here, but you've got business access off William Street. So is that going to stay the same, or are you going to have your business access off King? Uh, it seems to me that it's better off William because it's away from the big traffic. So that's just a question. Um, looking forward to seeing the progress and all the best. Thank you, Mr. Dixon. And I see Mr. Gower would like to also offer some comment. Go yeah, ahead. just briefely, thank you, Ray and Andre. Uh, there's an interesting project you've got going here. Um, my concern is now you've got a public lounge and no entrance from King Street and stairs on William. What is the accessibility for wheelchairs? Okay, so uh, these comments are also recorded in the minutes of today's meeting. And uh, I guess, if I'm seeing no other members of the public, we will move on to the next item. Thank you very much. It is the Heritage Eastman Agreement in Information Report. Does anyone have any questions for staff? I guess just uh, Correct me if I'm wrong, this was already approved by council as part of the application process when 81 King came to us, and it will be dissolved when the construction is complete and staff has been able to confirm that the conditions were met. Is that how it works? That's correct. So it's really just the uh, due diligence piece that we passed as part of the recommendation. Um, and, and was also presented to council last night. So the next one is the update regarding emergency approvals. That's 8F, 87 Wellington Street Stabilization of Rear Addition. Any questions? Seeing none. There are no motions. Mo notices of motion. Other business. Correspondence. No correspondence? Oh, that's rare. Okay, our next meeting is in a month, October 17th, 9.30, the week before the election. How exciting. I need a motion to adjourn. By Don, all those in favor?